Hey, hey, everybody. If you're tuning in to the Fortistown Archive, you know I'm your host, Jeff Kaiser. Welcome in. New episode, but not just any new episode. This is a milestone episode. Episode number 50. Wow, 50 episodes. Crazy to think that Here we are at number 50 right now. And for those of you that have been on the journey since the beginning, back in January of 2020, thank you to every listener, every supporter, every guest, because without you, the podcast would not be what it is today. And so much more as we look forward to the next 50 episodes. But right now, we're here, number 50. And I have a guest here with us. You might look at his face and say, I know that dude. Or if you're listening, you might pick up as soon as you hear that the special guest, Damien Moyo, who has been in a series of different bands over the years, all different types of music, but mostly known throughout the hardcore punk genre for bands like Morning Again, Culture, As Friends Rust, and Damian Dunn. We have Damian Moyle here on the podcast. Damian, how are you doing there, man? Doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So glad to have you on. I'm really excited to be able to <laughs> chat with you. Uh, you have a really amazing musical journey because you've been doing this for a long time, right? Since like the early 90s? Is that kind of when it all began? Yeah, since I was uh, 14 or 15. I guess 91, I think might have been the first uh, first band. Wow. Yeah. And you're still doing it today, right? You haven't really stopped. Is that true? I, why bother at this point? You know, <laughs> I, I did take, I, I took a, quite a while off, I would say like eight or nine years. Uh, oh, wow. First decade of the, of the aughts. Um, but that was about, that was about it. What do you do with your time when you're so used to playing music and being in bands and you take that eight, nine year hiatus? What do you do with that time? Man, uh, I think I, I like just drank instead. Uh, <laughs> I worked. I had moved to Michigan. Uh, I was just kind of doing other other stuff and and uh maybe because I moved from Florida and I didn't know very many people in Michigan, it was like easier for me to just sort of detach because I didn't have the um, influences or temptations of, of having a bunch of people who played music around me uh, or at least not that I knew of. Um, So yeah, I just kind of slid into this, just kind of like go to work uh, hang out with friends kind of life. And I guess I, I did still, I did still record music here and there, but just kind of, uh, on my computer, um, some of it ended up eventually becoming Damien Dunn material. But at the time I, I didn't think I would ever do a, a band again. Did you find that taking that kind of time off help you to rejuvenate your creativity and such? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could say it was it was why or that I you know that was the intent, but it just um, I definitely feel like I I came back to it a little a little wiser maybe. That's yeah. Well, the Damien Dunn stuff we'll obviously get to as that's a little bit later on in your career, but it was quite the departure from what a lot of people knew you of from the more of the the hardcore style of, of music. So uh, it was quite different than I think what a lot of people were used to hearing from you. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty, pretty big leap, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So, but we'll get more into that in just a little bit. So you're originally from outside of the United States, right? I think I read somewhere that you were actually, you were born uh, in the Netherlands. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, born in the Netherlands, and then I lived in uh, Columbus, Ohio, from the time I was, uh, I think, like two uh, to seven, and then that's when we moved to to Miami, to uh, North Miami Beach, and that's where I grew up. And how did you get to North Miami Beach? Why was that the place that your family moved to? My dad's family uh, 
was all living in in Miami, mostly in North Miami Beach area. Um, so they they moved over from uh, he was born and raised in Paris. They moved over in the uh, I don't know seventies, I guess early seventies, and then um, he kind of hopped around. Just he was sort of a career student uh, for many years. So um, he met my mom in in Mexico City. I was born in Holland. They got married in Holland. He went back to the states. Uh, started going to OSU in Columbus, and then eventually my mom and I made our way over there and uh, and joined up. Uh, with them so but but then after uh uh ohio state i guess uh for whatever reason you know the the idea was let's go to miami we'll have my family around and uh we'll just start our lives down there so they did what was that like for you being a young child living in north miami at that time i'm sure quite different than what it's become you know in the in current times yeah, uh, I liked it. I mean, I didn't, I, I guess I didn't, I was young enough that I didn't really have, um, well, I certainly didn't have a say, but I don't think I had a whole lot of uh, uh, a dog in the race either, either way. I remember being pretty excited that we were leaving Ohio. Um, and uh, yeah, North Miami Beach was, was all right. What was your first concert in Florida you remember seeing? Oh. It might have been, uh, I remember seeing Paul Simon with my parents uh, on the Graceland tour. And then uh, I, for some reason, I, I, and this is kind of, I've been thinking about this lately, actually, because it's a, it was a weird thing in the first place and even weirder than my parents let me go to it. But um, I was in the North Miami Beach Parks and Recreation kind of uh system i guess for like after school programs summer camp you know day camp kind of stuff and um the uh the after school program a couple of the counselors decided that they were going to go see kiss with ted nugent and they got permission to invite a couple of kids if their parents gave them permission or something so somehow i ended up going to see uh kiss on the i think it was like the hot in the shade or crazy nights tour it was it was like post makeup uh you know eric carr uh era of of kiss right i was young enough that i i didn't really give a shit i was just kind of excited to go to a a big uh uh concert but yeah those th those i guess would have been the first two i'm not sure which preceded the other you remember what venue that was at uh it was somewhere in sunrise or something uh sunrise musical theater maybe no it wasn't sunrise musical theater but it was somewhere i believe it was somewhere in broward county okay because um, i looked that up recently myself to figure out like where was that show and i remember seeing that it was like in like pembroke pines or something which okay not that far from north miami beach but yeah. as a kid you know uh uh you didn't cross county lines for for much uh, when you're that age so True. right especially when you're you're not driving or anything at that age so it's uh quite different so where'd you graduate high school oh i didn't um i if i well i should have graduated from uh, north miami beach senior high um i had a a few turbulent years during my high school days so i kind of um I was in and out of school. I was uh, constantly being transferred to different schools and then not not really uh, showing up and then getting moved somewhere else. Uh, so it was uh, basically, I stopped going to school. Um, so I remember coming to North Miami Beach Senior High School uh, to begin what I thought was gonna be my senior year. Cause I, I guess for some reason I was like a little more stable uh, for a minute. So I was like, I'm gonna go back to my neighborhood school and uh, do my senior year there and graduate with all my friends. And, and they were like, you're not starting 12th grade, man. You're, uh, you didn't go to school last year. So um, upon learning that I was uh, supposed to repeat 11th grade, um, I managed to get, uh, I think my mom to withdraw me uh, from high school. And then I just got my GED instead. But, um, you know, vicariously, uh, 
North Miami Beach Senior High, class of 94. Okay. Any classes you took that may have introduced you to any sort of music or instruments at that time? No, no. I, I did have, I remember the art class uh, was where a lot of my friends and I would convene and the 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 teacher, Ms. Nielsen, was like, really cool. She and her uh, late husband were like friends with William S. Burroughs or something. And she, she was like, she seemed to be into some kind of good music, but she fostered an environment where like, we, like we could listen to music in the classroom and she would like sneak me art supplies to, so that I would, you know, just stay out of trouble, I guess. Uh, when I was kind of uh, frequenting that, like visiting the school, but wasn't really supposed to be. And uh, so she, she was pretty cool, but I remember listening to like, um sick of it all in in uh in art class uh on like a little portable tape player yeah that was a way to do it i used to, I used to sit in band class and listen to vandals anarchy burger over and over and over again and so it helped shape <laughs> yeah. a lot. I did have a teacher at one of the schools that i was uh during those years where I was kind of shuffling around a little bit for, for a minute, I was at Coral Gables uh, high school and I had a debate teacher. I was only in this school for maybe two weeks, two, three weeks. Um, and I went the first day and uh, maybe like one other day, but there was a, a debate teacher there and she was asking around, like asking if anybody knew like where the, you know, the new kid, the new kid that like wasn't uh where i was and she found me uh at a uh, somebody else from the school or from the class was like volunteering at this place that i was so she found me there and she brought me i remember her bringing like a paper bag with a walkman and a bunch of tapes in it and there was like she had pixies do little um uh there was a flipper tape um what else was in there I want to say maybe um, ministry land of rape and honey. Um, Pretty good mix of stuff. Yeah, yeah. There were there were there were a handful of things in there because she, I don't know, she came to visit and you know just check in on me and brought me like a bunch of music that. Uh, um, I don't know if that was my introduction to the to the Pixies, but that was my first time owning Doolittle, and that was you know that yeah. Just, I I can't imagine that style of music would come from a mother and a father, at least back in that time period. So uh, the influence obviously came from somewhere. Uh, the the kids you were hanging out with at that time was there anyone specific who was also an influence on you at that early age? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so it kind of. Uh went something like this. I, I got myself into like rock and metal. Um, that was just me spending a lot of time in my room, uh, only kid, alarm clock radio, you know, uh, 97 GTR, 103 she, um, those, those were my stations. And I remember like, uh, just for some reason, I gravitated toward that stuff and I would put the radio on, on like one or two volume when I was supposed to be like sleeping. And I would have the pillow on over the alarm clock radio and, and like all night I would basically just sleep there kind of listening to, you know, ZZ Top and uh, Dirty and Blue Oyster Cult or whatever, whatever they're playing. Um, and I remember being like particularly grabbed by um, uh, Ozzy. Uh, I think it was Flying High again or something, but I remember like... Um, maybe vaguely knowing that he was from Black Sabbath, but that wasn't super relevant to me either yet. <clears throat> uh, but I remember like calling the radio station and asking them to play some Ozzy. And, and I think maybe with that phone call, it sort of cemented that uh, I was a rocker, you know? Um, I was I don't, like nine, you know, or something. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, around the same time I got, uh, uh, Van Halen's 1984. Uh, my parents got me a record player, took me to the 163rd Street Mall to pick out a uh, a record. Um, 
of my own. I had some, but they were like, you know, like Doobie Brothers records that I like borrowed from my parents' collection or um, a couple of 45s I ended up with, like some Spider-Man records and uh, stuff like that. But this was like the first time I like I had control over what what was coming into our house. So it was it was Van Halen's 1984, uh, and that was in in 1984. So I guess I was seven or eight uh, around then. And I just from that time uh, on, I kind of just paid attention to metal. I don't know that that was much of a a, a feat or made me like particularly. Um, I don't think that was that strange. It was it was the 80s, <clears throat> so. Metal was very much in the in the foreground, um, along with you know Fat Boys and whatever else was um, was was sort of popping at the time. So, uh, but I but I felt more of a sort of a, I felt drawn to 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 metal. And then by seventh grade, I had fully. Uh, I mean, I liked like you know Guns and Roses and stuff, but I was like really really starting to sort of gravitate toward uh, thrash. It was it, like all, um, you know, Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth, all that stuff. Um, and then from there is where I kind of, uh, something about kind of like reading up on that stuff in metal magazines. And, you know, it, it, back then you see it now because uh, people realize like how kind of, uh, how cool it is. But at the time it was, these bands were just happening concurrently. So you would, you'd see pictures of like James Hatfield in a, you know, in a Misfits shirt or, or somebody from nuclear assault wearing like an exploited shirt. And I, these things started entering into the, the, the periphery, you know, um, I was of course kind of already familiar with like the big, you know, uh, sex pistols. And you could, even then you could go into like a library and they'd have like a, a book on like, you know, hunks of, London you know, and you're looking at all these like black and white photos of like right. just Vivian Westwood shit and you know so I I was aware of all that stuff uh, I thought it was kind of goofy um and I was just too into sort of thrash uh to really care but then I remember um exploited and and corrosion of conformity really grabbed my attention from those metal magazines and uh I uh uh, liberated a couple of, of cassettes, you know, from, uh, from the mall. And so began my kind of, um, my, my journey into, uh, hardcore punk, I guess it was a little, uh, I didn't know that's what was happening because I didn't really know what those bands were. Uh, I sort of found them in this metal world. So to me, they were like extensions of metal, um, which uh, was not a, it wasn't too much of a leap because it, um, Corrosion of Conformity's Eye for an Eye, it's got a very sort of like Sabbathy bluesiness to it. There are weird little sloppy solos everywhere. It's a hardcore record, but there's like a, there's, there's some doomy Sabbathy stuff in there. And then uh, Exploited, it was, it was Let's Start a War, uh, said Maggie One Day, which is not metal, but very, very dark and um oppressive it's it's it it doesn't make me feel good still to this day um so there was a kinship with the metal stuff that i was listening it sure. felt metal it didn't sound right or or good necessarily either of those bands um i think even then without being a musician at all or coming from a family of uh, and nobody played instruments uh even then i think i i knew that uh they weren't doing it as well as overkill <laughs> it was like something's wrong with these guys they sound like shit their recordings are terrible um but i'm, I'm into it and then like right. it, for another year or so that i kind of realized there was this whole uh hardcore thing once you know minor threat and like agnostic front and that kind of stuff uh um dag nasty all, once those all started sort of coming into to play a lot of new york hardcore then i realized oh it's hardcore this is hardcore. Uh, and and then I would say by around like 91, uh, metal just got uh, kind of shitty. Um, the the Black Album was sort of the, uh, just ushered in a new, you know, era of, uh, I think Thrash as I knew and loved it was sort of dead. It had been replaced by like, um, you know, everybody cut their hair and started wearing like 
you know, tank tops and wallet chains and the solos went away, the speed went away, it got very mid-tempo and groovy, you know, and uh, very like sort of um, metal kind of lost maybe a little bit of like the, the feminine femininity, you know, the feminine sort of quality. Uh, and it, it felt uh, off balance and just sort of like lopsided and, and just a little too like uh, chest poundy. And, and uh, you know, this was like the heyday of, of biohazard and, you know, uh, House of Pain and uh, everything else that Pantera sort of sure. changed. Uh, I, guess, I guess at that point, it would make sense to transition to death metal because that still was <laughs> it still had that image, you know, a lot of the death metal yeah. bands. Yeah, they they lasted a couple years longer. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was I was into to to death metal uh, kind of at the same time as thrash. I don't even think I really made that much of a distinction until um, I, I would say like Entombed was the first time I kind of knew that I was listening to like this ain't thrash, you know. Um, but it was still it wasn't really my my thing. I was like, I I still had one foot in thrash and the other was like being pulled toward you know hardcore um and then there was a little bit of death kind of along the way like uh, death and morgoth and you know a couple of pestilence um but for the most part i sort of skipped you know i just kind of went just dove right into hardcore i guess at what age would you say you discovered local music uh uh, probably all around the same time, you know, um, the, the journey kind of starts, uh, yeah, under, under my pillow with the radio and then there are these magazines and I start stealing tapes and shit. And then, uh, and then, and then, and then it's like your friends that you roam your neighborhood with and the tapes that you trade amongst each other, but you're still kind of at the mercy of like, uh, you're only as strong as like your combined collection, you know? So it only went as far as like suicidal tendencies in the direction of my friend John's house and creator in the direction of my friend Matt's house. Uh, and, you know, whatever we were all stumbling into and, and sharing with each other. Um, but it was still very much like a neighborhood kind of initiative. Like it hadn't occurred to us to like go to shows. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I guess... Uh, I remember seeing, um, well, there were bands that would play like parties uh, locally, like kind of neighborhood bands. So there, that was kind of maybe my first time seeing like metal or, or punk kind of bands um, in person. And then uh, saw the Exploited at the Junkyard. That was 91 uh, with Biohazard and Typo Negative, uh, who I'm missed and didn't know who they were at the time anyway um i just went for exploited um i remember going uh some of our neighborhood friends and and i went to uh the new titans on the block tour which was uh <clears throat> sepultura napalm death sick of it all and uh sacred reich um also 91 that was in south beach that was at a short-lived club called the institute institution institute i think it was um yeah and then i remember i i actually i feel like before before those um uh, i may have caught a show or two at washington square um i don't really remember the chronology and you'll find out over the course of this <laughs> conversation uh my memory's a little toasted but i i i, I remember seeing like I don't know, some local show at, at uh, Washington Square. And then later, I remember seeing like uh, uh, Iceburn and um, Rancid. I think that was like the last show at the square. Uh, yeah. Definitely some pretty good shows to kind of get yourself started and then you know, being able to, uh, to check out the scene and what have you. Did you get a chance to experience any local band in the early years that they were for you like you you wanted to check them out maybe even you were surprised that that band was even from the area was there any band like that at that time that you gravitated more to 
No, I, I think the first band that I remember being like, they're from here, from Florida, um, was, yeah, it would have been like one of the Tampa like death metal bands. Um, I don't think, I don't think I was really, uh, I was, I, I think when I started going to shows regularly, um, the hardcore bands that I was aware of in South Florida were all sort of that wave was like just kind of ending. Um, so I kind of like started coming ar around at sort of the, the end of like beyond reason and, um, bands like that, who I only knew from, you know, seven inches and uh, compilations and, and stuff. Um, so I didn't really, yeah, I don't know. I guess, uh, the, the, the local band that I remember seeing around a lot first, um, might've been load. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I would say by like 90, by 92, I had started kind of like getting my bearings and knowing like, okay, these are the venues that have shows and these are the venues that are, you know, all ages. And this is where I can go find flyers and, oh, there's that name again. Here's this, you know, and you start kind of putting two and two together and, and um, you, you start connecting dots, I guess, of like, uh, who the bands are. It was still a little bit of a weird time too, because uh, you didn't make, well, it was a good time for this reason. You didn't make a distinction between um, what kind of band they were necessarily. So even though I was like super into hardcore and was kind of like finding myself gravitating toward that, um, I still, you know, listen to the Pixies and I still listen to Sepultura and I still, uh, like shit like that so so it didn't matter if it was like a quit you know or hairy pussy or you know it didn't matter what the, if i would see those names enough on flyers um they all belong to like one sort of underground alternative uh body to me <clears throat> where they fell on that sort of spectrum was almost like irrelevant uh just the fact that they were doing it at that level and in those places and for kids that kind of uh i i felt that i sort of identified with made them um for me yeah that makes sense and did you find that some of these bands were playing some of the same type of venues that maybe you had not been to before but now these local bands were playing these places that maybe were never on your radar any memories of seeing yeah those at certain places you wanted to talk about yeah, I think at the time, like my my frame of reference really was sort of limited to the square, the junkyard, and the that little corner of uh, of South Beach and the handful of shows I'd I'd been to there. Um, and then I started kind of noticing like the the Broward, um, you know, venues uh, popping up more. Um, Summers, Button South, and Plus Five. I always confuse. I don't, I don't remember which preceded. Uh, which um yeah uh and then and then um i remember also i i guess to jump ahead a, maybe a couple of years which maybe i shouldn't do because that's the couple of years where i started playing music um <clears throat> well yeah eventually i kind of fell in more with people from my name when i started playing music uh we'll, we'll go there um the band was uh there was a there was a local band of uh friends i wasn't particularly tight friends with them um but my friends were good friends with them they had a band called midget stew uh that just you know they were skaters they played um hardcore punk stuff there i remember they played like my friend jessica's uh birthday party and they covered uh at least two minor threat songs and and this was kind of like right when i was like getting kind of uh um really crazy about uh minor threat and just like all just really voraciously consuming uh hardcore um so they broke up um uh, something had i think there were two brothers in the band and they both left so then it was like drummer and bassist kind of you know wanted to start a new band and uh there were there were only a handful of like punks at our school at North Miami Beach um, where if I wasn't enrolled I was I was 
loitering around anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I remember the, the drummer of U.S. Decline um, asked me to come sing at, at practice because they had a couple of new songs. They wanted to start a new band. Let's just, you know, mess around. Let's see what happens. Um, I think it was just because it was a small pool and I had a shaved head and it was just, uh, you know, he'll do. So um, did they know if you can sing or not? Like, how, how did they no. pick you? <laughs> okay. This is like, this, so this is what became U.S. Decline, which was like <laughs> a cross between, I would say, pretty like low to mid tier American hardcore punk and a little bit of kind of like UK, like 82, you know, that was a little like, it was a little, uh, I think I even sang in a, in a British accent um, because I didn't know, I was like, I don't know. I mean, this is, this sounds like kind of exploited -y, So I guess like, you, you know, I, uh, not, not like overtly, but uh, I, I've detected notes of, uh, you know, a little, a little Cockney uh, <laughs> uh, tinge there, but yeah, it was, they didn't know, but it also didn't matter. I mean, how you couldn't, you can't really fuck up that kind of, you know, the worst you can be is just like not a very good punk band, but like a bad singer is never going to make you unlistenable to, uh, to people who are, who've, who've made a whole uh, life of listening to unli unlistenable music. So, um, but it worked. I liked it. Uh, I liked it a lot. And then I had to leave that band for a while. Um, they continued with a, with another singer and actually recorded and started playing a lot. And that scene, um, the scene that, that, that was from my neighborhood, from, from North Miami beach, um, that sort of erupted out of that was, uh, the, the drummer of us decline and my friend Morris did a zine called idiot nation. Um, and then, uh, so they started unbeknownst to me because I didn't I've, I've I'm 46 and I've kind of never done this but they started tapping into a more vast network of like they were talking to bands and zines and labels from like out of the state out of the country even sometimes which I thought was amazing because I was having a hard enough time just sort of like just keeping my 15 year old head on you know straight and like I didn't have kind of the stability stability to really like tap into a network like that and 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 um see it as anything more than kind of a local neighborhood you know or miami sort of thing um but i learned a lot i remember from from that uh and eventually they started putting out tapes uh under the name pathetic records um pr had this little pr logo and i and they put out um a U.S. Decline tape, a Sloth tape, uh, Organized Pain, which was uh, John Wiley from Morning Again. It was like one of his previous um, bands. Uh, and they, um, the, the singer of U.S. Decline, Scott, his uh, brother-in-law, um, his wife's brother or girlfriend's brother, um, uh, had a... Um, lived above a carpet shop or something or and, and basically had this empty like office space above a carpet shop in like this really sort of shitty little strip mall right off of the high off of 95 uh i think and that became the pr house um from pr records so this scenes kind of sprouted up from there and that was really cool because that was kind of my that's when i started uh by then i kind of i i I was aware of like the bands that were doing shit in my, you know, I was uh, aware of, you know, um, Load and Timescape and Cavity probably already. And, you know, I'd see those bands at at shows, but this was like kind of our little sub scene, the PR scene. But it also started introducing me to bands from across the county line, um, like the Shrooms and like bands like that. And that kind of uh, gave me more exposure to like, Broward and I was like you mean you mean people live up there like past <laughs> Ives Dairy Road what and um and I think that's kind of when it all started like growing a little bit um the, the local scene was getting bigger to me I kind of wasn't paying much attention to it I'd, I'd see the handful of bands I knew in Miami and then um I'd see a touring band every now and then if they bothered coming down um and aside from that I was just living my life and like listening to music in my headphones 
it wasn't something I was really seeking with with too much diligence. One band, one band who's come up many times on the podcast, Ambugalard. Were you a fan of theirs? Did you ever get a chance to see them play live? I did see Ambugalard at either Button South or Plus Five. Always get those two confused. Um, I, it was kind of when I was sort of like decidedly not really giving as much of a shit about metal. Um, but I remember always being impressed with like their, uh, like their branding, you know, they had like a cool logo and they had good artwork. Um, uh, yeah, I guess there were a few like Miami kind of metal bands that I remember, whether it was like Saigon Kick or, you know, uh, Nuclear Valdez and then Solstice. There, there were a bunch of like uh, bands that were, it, w- it was kind of all on your radar at the time. If you were into any of those sort of smaller subcultural scenes you somehow just absorbed at least some uh like basic working knowledge of the other bands in the other scenes uh, i guess it's just the age you know you're paying a lot sure. yeah. yeah why did you leave us decline uh i left us decline because i was institutionalized uh for, for six months, um, I went away to Melbourne, Florida, and was uh, at a place there that was like a, um, it was a, they called it a dual diagnosis center. So it was kind of a like behavioral um, slash uh, drug abuse uh, kind of uh, thing. My, my deal was mostly behavioral, but I think I had like a social worker working on my stuff that knew that uh, the places I could go were, would be much better if um they played up the fact that every now and then I like to drink or, you know, um, smoke a little weed or whatever. So they were like, yeah, sure. Um, but anyway, I was, I was gone for six months and I told them, you know, it was like, dude, I mean, we had like four songs, you know? Um, so it was like, by all means continue. Um, and they did. And that actually began kind of a, a long, uh, sort of, uh, history of, uh, me starting bands that then went on to do much more and much better uh, with the singers that replaced me. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with you one bit. So while you were there in Melbourne, what was going through your mind in terms of your next project? Were were you thinking about that? Were you starting to write anything while you were in Melbourne? And then in preparation for what came after that? Because I think you continued on with even a more hardcore band after us decline yeah what happened after us decline? okay so i i um no i wasn't in there sort of plotting my next move or anything i was just sort of in there uh i don't know just being a miserable adolescent um but i was uh I remember while I was in that place getting like a a pass um, where uh, I was able to get a counselor to take me to a mall. And, um, and I remember buying uh, uh, green days, uh, 1039 and uh, super chunk, no Pocky for kitty. I guess this would have been like early 92 now or sometime in 92, I think. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. And um. And I remember listening to a lot of like uh, subhumans and germs in there and like MOD. And uh, there was a rate, there was a college radio station up there that played really good stuff. And I remember like um, that was when I first heard like fast backs and high back chairs and a bunch of uh, kind of cool sort of like alternative stuff. Um, but when I got out of there, yeah, US Decline was already kind of up and running. I think they were starting to put out the tapes. Um, I was kind of contributing illustrations and like drawings for their flyers and their zine uh, slash label, this this sort of like little um, enterprise that they had started. Um, and that's when I started doing uh, Insist. Insist. Yeah, that would have been the next one. And that was more informed by kind of, I would say like New York hardcore. Um, of a of a slightly uh um 
heavier, uh, moshier, metallic variety. Um, I think a, a lot of us, this might have just been regional, but at least speaking for myself, the the two, um, the uh, where the wild things are and the New York hardcore, the way it is comp, um, those were, that was sort of my crash course in like New, New York hardcore. And I, uh, we, we started playing like that kind of stuff that was insist. And did, then, you, uh, did you feel like you connected more to the New York scene versus maybe like LA, Boston, DC, like was New York just more what that kind of vibe you were into? You know, I didn't, I hadn't really started to, uh, cluster or, or like connect sounds to regions yet with the exception of, I mean, I had these New York hardcore comps with all this hardcore that sounded a kind of a certain way, you know, with a few exceptions, uh, super chunk or, you know, there, there were a couple of, of, of bands doing different things on there, but for the most part, it was a sound. And, um, I didn't know necessarily that it was the New York hardcore sound. I just thought it happened to be a compilation of New York hardcore bands, but like for all, you could have told me that all the, St. Louis hardcore band sound like this too. And I probably would have, you know, mostly um, believed it. Although that stuff didn't sound like other stuff I liked, like Seven Seconds or Dag Nasty or, or um, right. but I don't think I really thought of that as like, that's DC and this is New York and, you know, Detroit's got this sound. And um, yeah, so so uh, I, I would just say it was like more of a, a, a casualty of like the numbers. Like, like numerically speaking, I was just hearing more New York hardcore than non-New York hardcore at the time. Yeah. The, yeah. And that makes sense. Uh, and especially, you know, you thinking about it back then, I think for a lot of us, we weren't kind of putting things together regionally, maybe through like compilations a little bit, but uh, nowadays it's like, yeah, now you can really look at it retrospectively and say, okay, I know which bands are from, which area because they sound a certain way and what have you the, the look and everything so yeah how did you get linked up with the insist guys uh the insist guys were uh just friends from high school and just people i i knew and then i asked uh sky who had been in um u.s decline uh to play bass in that and so he played bass um Manny and Alex played guitar and then my friend Jerome uh played played drums and I don't really know how that came together I don't remember if somebody said they needed a a, a singer I, I feel like I mostly assembled that cast because I don't think a lot of them knew each other um that was pretty short-lived we we had like a practice recording and um we practiced quite a bit actually but all that survived was like one practice recording and then that band broke up around the same time as the aforementioned uh, organized pain. So half of Insist, uh, Sky and I again, uh, joined up with half of organized pain, including their singer. And we did a two singer uh, hardcore band called Reach. Um, Reach was my... No, Insist was the band, the first time that I ever actually played a show at the PR house, in fact. Um, I think I played two shows with Insist and then one show with Reach in a cul-de-sac uh, <clears throat> at night until the cops came. And and those were those were my first uh, first few shows. What happened when the cops came? Uh, they just, you know, that was it. We just dispersed. Okay. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> So after Insist, Reach, which again, some of the members of, of Insist, Organized Pain. Uh, what do you remember about the first Reach show? Not much. That was just that that was the uh that was the one and only. That was the that was the only one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one one Reach show, I think two Insist shows before that, and that was it. My first three shows. So then after Reach, you so have to reach um, a good friend of mine, uh, Zeke, who was in a band called Trauma, uh, also from our, our neighborhood. He, um, I started playing with with a couple of people from his band on the side, his drummer and, and the other guitarist, uh, Alex and JP. 
we practiced a few times. That band was called Hand Over Fist. Um, we wrote a couple of songs, never made it out of like the, the bedroom, you know? Um, I remember the stuff being like good, but it was also kind of, uh, it was it was hardcore that was very informed by kind of Pantera and like that sort of newer, like groovier, uh, more kind of uh, gorilla kind of, you know, metal. Um, and it was, it was, it was cool. It was cool. Um, I remember there being like a hell of a riff involved, but I also remember trying to like show them, uh, um, sick of it all tapes and stuff and just being like, you see how it's like shittier. It's, you know, it's faster and it's shittier. And I was like, I think I was trying to mold it into a, a proper hardcore band. Um, I liked what we were doing nonetheless. Um, but that's that's when I tried out for culture, and that's when I when things kind of, um, I guess, became a little more real as far as uh, singing for a band. Culture, the reggae band. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> culture, the hardcore band. Yeah, that was the first time that I ever discovered who you were was through culture. As I remember, I was at I think one of my first local shows back when I don't know if they still do this. I don't go to as many shows nowadays, but where they'd have all the distros set up. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I saw a culture CD. And uh, so, yeah, so culture was the first band that you were in where you were kind of making it more like you were touring and you were putting out, records and that sort of thing going into studios and what have you so what do you remember about the early formation of culture uh well i remember the studio part but we didn't do much of the other stuff um what i remember what and this is now i guess we're in um 93 now maybe 94 whenever the the culture demo came out uh i was a fan of culture um I didn't know them. Well, I, I knew John Wiley loosely because I was, I had just been in a band with a couple of his former uh, bandmates. Um, and he's the one actually who ultimately asked me to come uh, sing for culture. But um, I had the demo. I liked it a lot. Uh, the fact that they had recorded was, was cool. I knew that like, this guy was in that band ego trip that was part of that wave of hardcore that I like missed by, you know, by, by a minute. Um, so it was a little exciting to me where I was like, these guys are for real, you know, um, because they recorded four songs with Jeremy Stoska. They were like, they were like real to me. Like, this is like a, um, a big deal. So I tried out, um, the band was just kind of a heavy hardcore band at the time. I guess, you know, they, they were all straight edge kids. I was not a straight edge kid. Um, I was, however, uh, going to, uh, to meetings. So I was, I was, uh, um, clean, um, smoking cigarettes, but clean. And, uh, and I started, I started playing with them. Um, I guess that's kind of when I decided to like, just stop smoking and, and, uh, and, you know, claim straight edge. Cause I was like, well, I need to scream now all the time. So <laughs> I should probably quit these things. And <laughs> straight edge seems, you know, uh, cool, you know? Um, so I, the band kind of went in that direction, but, uh, what I do remember is I tried out and basically they said, awesome. You're in, we have studio time booked in 10 days. We're going to record an album. And I was like, fuck, uh, all right. So I had to learn um, seven songs and write three songs with them in that course of time, which felt actually like very doable because we seem, I think we practiced like all the time back then. Um, so we went into the studio, we recorded, we decided we didn't like that version. And I remember uh, going back in like a month or two later and doing a second version, which we also didn't like. And then we recorded a third version, which is the really ugly record uh, behind you. 
um, born of you. And that's the version that came out. But um, so my, my experience in culture during those early days was like mostly practice, three recordings for the same album and um, a handful of shows uh, in that time. I think my first show with culture was at the blue chair in, in uh, Ybor, uh, Ybor city. Um, and then uh, the second show um, was at, uh, at the kitchen club in the Grove. And that was um, with uh, Strife and Sick of It All and, and Machine. I think that was not long after they moved uh, from, from the beach to, to the Grove, the kitchen. Machine being a local band also from the Miami area. Uh, any memories of seeing them play? Yeah, I, I feel like I saw Machine maybe like two or three times. Um, I always liked it. I, I always liked that kind of, uh, I didn't, this is another case of not having the terminology yet, but um, sort of post-hardcore, I think already I was starting to be like, oh, that's kind of interesting how there's like, you know, these bands that are kind of doing that like, super touch quicksand kind of thing um and i really liked those two seven inches on uh on youth bus um and i guess maybe that's how i met uh jason letterman who, who you've had on um your show but uh yeah those were the early culture days there was no uh, i never left i i ended up out of the band actually before the record came out before we held it in our hands Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know, I guess it, looking back, I guess I just still was not really serious about being in bands at the time. So like if I get in an argument or enough arguments with the guys in the band, I just be like, this is fucking dumb, man. I don't want to do this. So I was uh, I remember John Wiley and I had a lot of um, we butt heads a lot because I think he and maybe some of the other guys in the band were really like getting kind of really fired up about like this like militant you know vegan straight edge kind of um uh image and i remember it got a little uncomfortable to me when i was being told to like jump around more and say more threatening shit in the mic and i was just like what no and uh so i i left um and then uh and, and then i guess that's when uh, shy Halud started was after that who was responsible for the artwork on the culture lp oh we chose that francis bacon painting um mm -hmm. that's on the cover but when we sent it we sent it to the label um conquer the world who they've, they've got kind of a history i mean we didn't really know this at the time um i think we were just excited because they put out like chokehold or something um but they they uh they were not good at design and we weren't good at direction, apparently. Um, nonetheless, we were thrilled when it came out. We we're like, look at this. It's an actual record. It plays and everything. Um, so I don't think we were super, I, don't, I think it took us a minute or a couple of years maybe to look at it and just be like, that's one of the ugliest record covers I've ever seen. It's so bad. It's so pixelated. It's um, like it was on like, like like Mac Paint or something like that back it, in the. I'm sure, it was. I'm sure <laughs> it was. Isn't there a story? And I could be off on off on this, but wasn't isn't there a story on like something happening with Conquer the World, like them not doing something, or did anything happen with with them like that where the relationship just maybe soured with Conquer the World? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um. I think it just sort of fizzled for culture. Uh, and then John and I uh, ironically ended up doing mourning again. Um, Cause it, at some point after I left culture, he left culture too. I was already doing Chai Halud, but uh, he called me up and was like, let's do a band like culture minus all the vegan straight edge stuff. Don't worry. You know? Um, and, uh, and also maybe minus like a lot of the, melodic stuff and let's just do it like way more metal and i was like you promise no vegan straight edge stuff and like, i still was you know but i just did not i was already tired of it was like it was just really starting or becoming like a big big thing in in hardcore and i was already just fucking tired of it um 
So yeah, that was the condition was no vegan, no straight edge. And we got a deal. Let's do a band. So we started playing together and the songs that I was uh, on um, are not vegan straight edge songs. I was really like trying my hard to an artist to kind of write about other um, stuff. Uh, but eventually uh, I left the band. And when those were, those those songs came out on Conquer the World too, five of them. Um, also hideous uh, cover. Uh, that EP was called mm -hmm. The Cleanest War. And later Good Life put together another record behind you, uh, the green one. And you'll see they put three X's right across because uh, that that compilation was uh, of songs that I was on was assembled after I left. Uh, and I guess, I, you know, I I left and I guess maybe they just reassessed and they were like, you know, life is much easier for a vegan straight edge band. <laughs> People know how to categorize us. They know what to do with us. Let's let's fucking do it. So they just uh, they became Morning Again, Triple X version and uh and that's fine. They, Did the band know like that was going to happen or was it after the fact once they were already were printed? Um, no, they knew they, they, they provided a uh, good life who, who put out that hand of hope uh, collection. Um, they provided good life with that logo. They had that logo made. So they, yeah, that was a very conscious, like, you know, let's put some X's on this thing. Yeah. Wow. It's a good one. It's a good letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Morning Again came after Culture, and I never had a chance to see Culture live, but I did see Morning Again a couple times, both with you and Kevin. And talk about the Morning Again years. What do you remember about the first show that you that you played with Morning Again? That, that was a big year for me. I think 96 was like a big year for me in, in terms of kind of uh, local, like the, the hardcore scene. Um, that's when I spent the most time going to shows. I think by then it was, I, I was playing too much music to not, I may as like, I may as well just go to the shows I'm not playing. Was, you know, it, it was, that's when I was like, uh, I guess officially had nothing better to do. But um those were kind of the cheers years, I guess. Um Morning Again, yeah, we 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 got that together really quickly. We wrote those songs quickly, recorded them quickly. I, uh and that first EP, The Cleanest uh War, um I think it had something special that like even though the whole chuggy vegan straight edge militant thing was happening, there was something a little different about that early morning again stuff. Uh, Louis, the drummer at the time, was a big part of that. Um, very like sort of almost like hip hop -y, you know, and just it had a different sort of bounce uh, to it. And um, yeah, people people uh, dug that stuff. We did a tour. That was my first tour. Uh, was with Morning Again. Um, it was just a couple weeks up like the. Midwest, East Coast, into Canada. Um, and that was pretty eye-opening. It was really cool to see other scenes. Um, Cause up until then, my only experience was really, uh, you know, um, Miami, Broward, Tampa, uh, Vero Beach, uh, Melbourne, shows at like the brothel schoolhouse um, in, in uh, the Florida theater or whatever it was in Tampa and, um, state theater, state theater. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, the blue chair in Ebor was maybe gone by then. Um, and there was, a uh, fuck, there was like a Christian coffee shop. Mocha Joe, Joe Mocha's the refuge. I think it was Joe Mocha's or Mocha Joe's was the coffee place. And the refuge was the, the venue part um, that was in Tampa. So that, that was kind of my experience was all pretty limited, li limited to like central and South Florida. Hmm. So getting in a van and playing like Atlanta and then, you know, some Carolina and then Ohio and all that, like, and then being up in like Toronto playing a show was just like kind of wild, uh, wild to me. Culture had been doing that, but it was all like without me you know, after I left. So it was kind of, uh, it was cool. And I guess at that point, 
now I'm like, I hadn't been taking this very seriously. Um, but now I have like a little, a small handful of, of things to show for it. Like, I'm like I'm on these like three records, you know, this is a, this is not a thing I did. It's like actually a thing I do. And, um, and it's fun to like travel around and play music and I don't have anything else better to do, you know? So I think that's when I started being like, I keep doing this for a while. There was and, a, there was a kid so I was, I was friends with who had a tattoo on his bottom lip and it was of the three X's on the morning again, hand of hope record. Oh. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, I need to listen to these guys. It's so one is going to tattoo their lip with three X's on the inside. So it was pretty serious, I guess. So there were definitely, I feel like when I would go to a morning again show, the, the people who were there, it was, it was almost as if, and this just, just could be through my own lens, but it was almost as if it was a band that came from out of town. Did you feel like that? Like, did you feel when Morning Again may have played? Maybe, maybe, maybe not at that moment, maybe in retrospect, or maybe even in the moment that you felt like people really came out to see you guys play? I did. I did. It didn't, we seemed to not have, like with culture, I remember it was like, we were always working hard at it. You know, we were practicing, we were trying to get tight, we were playing shows, we were hoping people came out. Stuff was happening outside of Florida for culture, but it wasn't like, we weren't really feeling, um, we weren't seeing the kind of ROI, you know, like locally. But um, yeah, with Morning Again, it was kind of, it was weird that that first uh, recording came out and we made demos and it felt like uh, even locally, uh, it was just really well received and and pretty much right away, the songs, you know, had like big pileups and sing-alongs. And it was like, wow, this is cool. And, and that's when I think uh, the shows, uh, they were still pretty mixed in, in 96, but I think that's when um, the hardcore contingency uh, or, or, you know, contingent of, of, of South Florida started to become big enough and there were enough bands that you could actually have a three, four or five band bill with only hardcore bands, which had been pretty uh, rare in South Florida up until then. You know, what you did, you had a ska band <laughs> with a metallic hardcore band with a pop punk band and you were all going to go to Denny's when it was over. Um, but yeah, I think those cheers days is when it started to feel more like a hardcore scene. Like, I would get these pictures from shows at Cheers and I was like, this is this is what pictures look like, like when you see, you know, photos of like other kind of like uh, esteemed clubs from other like, you know, more celebrated scenes. I was like, we've right. done, we're starting to have like a lot of hardcore and a lot of hardcore shows and a lot of fucking people turning out. Um, so that was fun. And yeah, it did feel like maybe because we had toured and because we had this, uh, this record, um, it, it just felt like maybe we came out of the gate a little stronger uh morning again yeah. was, there, was there a certain morning again song that you say was like the crowd pleaser people really just went went crazy for that song i only did those seven songs with them and i and i feel like most of those seven certainly the first five from the cleanest war um they all had a little bit of that appeal. I think the really the one that I always remember being like really crazy um, sing alongs was uh, the the last two songs, seven inch, the song God Framed Me um, ends with this big. I was going to say that. that would have been my pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think the reason the Trash Your Cross pile up uh, resonates with me or like really sticks in my memory. Uh, I think there are two reasons. One is it's one of the first times that I realized I could orchestrate that. Like you can write these parts into a song to be those parts. And I started like learning like, Oh shit. Yeah. Okay. Repetition. And um, you know, I, and I started becoming sort of fixated on this idea of like, I want, I don't want people to have to know the record to know the lyrics. I only want them to have to sit through like one chorus. And then by the end of the song, I just want 
you know, people on top of each other, uh, uh, even if it's their first time hearing it. So that's kind of, that, that was like sort of mission accomplished with that part. It, it became what I wanted it to. And then I also remember, uh, given the lyrical content, Trash Your Cross, uh, I remember um, that some of the strong arm guys uh, would be up front piling up and singing along with everybody else. And I always thought that was kind of cool where I was like, hey, these guys uh, who have a very um, uh, a different, you know, kind of spiritual agenda, um, they're going ape shit <clears throat> to this song. Right. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was always a big <laughs> Was that a song that you wrote lyrically? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I by then I was already sort of uh, firmly against with culture because I joined. Um, some of the songs already existed. I had to sing some uh, lyrics that Rich had written. By the time "Born of You" came out, it was I think seven of those ten were were mine. Um, and by then I had sort of decided uh, I'm not singing other people's lyrics. If I'm doing this, it's because I. I have I want to say something so I don't know if that's uh like I'm not being a team player or something there but I I, I kind of never understood um hardcore singers that didn't write the lyrics uh it was always kind of weird to me but yeah those, those were those were my thing you, you also mentioned earlier that culture didn't tour but when culture reunited years later you did tour right yeah yeah so so 95, at the end of 95, I'm doing Shai Hulud and Morning Again. Um, well, Morning Again's getting started. Shai Hulud's been around for, for a few months. Uh, 90, in, during the course of 96, I, I, was, uh, I left Shai Hulud. I toured with Morning Again and got kicked out upon, upon returning to Florida. Um, started as friends Russ, started bird of Omen, rejoined culture that that was 96 also for me um and at that point uh th honestly the main reason i rejoined culture um was because they were touring because my only taste of touring had been morning again which i was now out of and uh the as friends Russ guys uh i don't think they wanted to tour um, so I remember like, I was at a point where maybe I was just down to Birdaville Omen and, and culture, culture had just moved to, uh, Gainesville. So I started going up there, practicing with them, writing some new stuff, playing a couple of shows, but I was still like, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I, I might just stick with Birdaville Omen, see what happens. Um, but then uh, the culture guys, uh, there, there was a European tour booked. Um, so I was very much interested because I, I wanted to tour and I definitely wanted to tour uh, Europe. And I did. And when I came back, that's when I was just like, it had gone beyond, I love playing shows. I want to keep doing this. Uh, it had gone beyond touring the East Coast was really fun. I want to do that again. And now it was like, I got to go back to Europe and keep playing shows. Cause that was, uh, that was the, that was like a real game changer for me. And you have a story about playing a show in Europe with culture later where I know I joked about it in the beginning when we talked about culture, but culture, the reggae band also uh, very well known yeah. that some patrons came out thinking that they might be seeing uh culture the reggae band and not culture the hardcore band so what can you tell us about that story yeah that was that was that first tour uh 97 um yeah we're in 97 now uh we were in i believe berlin and we were going to be playing um this this squat um like a 10 story building with like murals all over it. People lived in it. They had a venue, they had a bar, they had a bookstore, all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, it, it was cool. We were there early. Um, I guess we had done like sound check and eaten some food or something. We were just hanging out <clears throat> in front of the, the building. And um, 
eventually one of us noticed that like uh rastafarians had been getting out of taxis <laughs> uh you know the the first couple you don't really like pay pay any mind to but like all of a sudden there's like you know like a dozen dreadlocked like rastafarians and uh and then it just dawned on one of us where we were like oh shit you don't think you know and uh yeah sure enough they they had seen a culture <laughs> on you know uh an announcement for culture playing and and here they were, and we, we, uh, yeah, we had to break it to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely quite the contrast in terms of, uh, sound and everything. So, uh, hopefully they liked what they saw if they stuck around. I don't know if they did. I don't think they did. I think they were all just like, oh, fuck this. (laughs) (laughs) They were out. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Uh, great story. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, reggae and the band. I like, both cultures. So I want to go back to Shai Halud. I know we kind of jumped over that a bit and went into Morning Again. But when I think about Shai Halud and I think of all the bands of that period that I'm a personal fan of, Shai Halud is definitely in my top five uh, bands of that period and from Florida. So let's talk about how you got involved with them. I think, uh, I think Matt Fox was was yeah. there and some other members uh of the band that were still that were there so what are your memories of getting started with shy halud and recording the demo um so i was you know freshly bandless after leaving um uh culture and um i remember uh talking to uh ravi a, a mutual friend of mine and matt fox's and and he was the one who actually said um Oh, dude, you're not doing culture anymore. You should talk to Matt Fox. He he's he's been wanting to start a hardcore band. He loves hardcore, and I was like, I knew who Matt Fox was, but I I wasn't like really friends with him. And he's like, actually, he's loading his stuff into his car right now because he just played a show around the corner. This was downtown Fort Lauderdale on the the block that the Edge uh, and the or uh, Re- Revolution now, um, and uh, the Poor House. It was Nocturnal Cafe at the time, Tavern Two Thirteen, whatever. He had been playing a show with uh, the One-Eyed Kings um, at the time. He was, uh, fill, I think, just filling in or something. So I caught, I was like, hey, Matt. And he's like, oh, hey, what's up, Matt? We didn't really know each other that well. And I, and I told him, Robbie mentioned you're wanting to start a hardcore band. I'm not doing culture anymore. Um, you want to play some music. So that was the beginning of uh, Shia Luke. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, we didn't know each other well, but we started hanging out. Um, he had a few uh, parts kind of already um, written. I think he, a few is probably an understatement. He, I think he's always got like a hundred rattling around. Um, but I remember him coming to my apartment and just sitting on the floor with an unplugged electric guitar and writing the first couple of songs that that way. Yeah. Was a name already decided or did that come after the real formation of the band? I feel like we had it very early because I think that uh, Matt had been sitting on that one for a while. I think he, I think it was one of those, like, you know what I've always wanted to call a band? Cause he was like a big uh, dune freak. Um, so I think it, if it wasn't already kind of uh, in his pocket, um, it came out right away. And I don't remember there being anything else really uh, on the table. I think just kind of from the beginning, we were going to call ourselves Shia Loot. And it just fit like, I mean, I don't know, like the name, the sound, everything, you know, for me, at least it's just like, okay, if that was, if that's what Shia Loot was going to sound like, that's what it should sound like. Uh, where did you record the demo and who did you record it with? Uh, at Studio 13 with Jeremy Staska again. Yeah. So at this point, all of my recording experiences with Jeremy Staska, all, all three of those attempts at the Born of You, uh, the Culture LP, um, a couple of other smaller sessions for Culture, Morning Again, both sessions, uh, and now uh, Shai Halu. 
What was it like recording with them? Because obviously you went back more than once. So what was it like recording with Jeremy? And I've heard some stories about, uh, you know, the amounts of, 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 of weed that would be smoked in the studio. So what are your memories of that? And why do you think he was someone you went back to? Um, well, no, no, um, no slight against Jeremy, uh, cause I think he, he was really good for the time and doing a great service to the scene. Um, he was the only person we knew. So that's mainly why we went back to him. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was good. It was cool to be in like a studio like that. It was, um, uh, yeah, I remember him, um, just smoking copious <laughs> amounts of, uh, of weed being like super personable really easy to get along with um and i feel like it might have been the first time i ever saw like waveforms on a screen i don't know that he was using he might have been using like an early kind of version of pro tools but like not really for the reasons you know the, in the way people use it came to use it um but i think he was somehow uh getting this stuff like transferred to digital from the reels because we were recording on reels but i remember seeing a, a waveforms on a screen and just being like what is that yeah pretty innovative for the the time for sure and uh we talked about jason letterman from machine days and and also beyond i know, I know we didn't mention him for this but also you mentioned beyond reason as well which was also uh in and he was also the drummer at that time, right? For Shai Uh Not at the time that we recorded. I believe Steve Kleisath was already in the band when we recorded, but uh, Jason was the first drummer. Um, I brought him in. Uh, and then Matt brought in the other two guys, Oliver on guitar and Dave Silver on, on bass. Um, and uh yeah at a certain point jason left uh yeah he left and then we got steve from uh from strong arm were there any shows that you remember playing at that time with shy haloon yeah we played uh we played a bit we we did um the first show i remember was on halloween it was in vero beach at the discount uh practice space their warehouse uh i think we did like two cro mags covers that was our first show and then uh, and then we played a, a show that i booked at an art gallery uh, off of uh davy road in like fort lauderdale like east of 95 um and that was donut run shy halud tension and discount um and then I remember we we played that place I mentioned at Tampa, the like sort of Christian coffee house venue. Uh, Shia Lou played there with, um, I don't know who we played there with, but yeah, we 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 played we played around. Uh, and Shia Lou was a band that I think got different labels, you know. Although I don't know if it was ever like one of those situations where the band necessarily labeled itself where it was like, well, they're a Christian band. Well, they're a straight edge band, you know? So did you all get that back then where people were trying to label Shia Lou, but couldn't really label the band? Cause it wasn't like there was anything on a cover of an album or maybe lyrically that least I can remember that would have signified something specific. It didn't say Shia Hulu XXX. <laughs> That's right. No, we, um, we uh no nobody labeled us i think it, we were just a hardcore band at least that's what we thought you know uh I, I will say that we were doing um the sort of there were a lot of the sort of um there was a lot of the melody or the style of of like strong arm which matt was pretty openly admit, would admit he's like yeah man i just want to do a secular strong arm um I think we made it our our own thing for sure, but uh, I think they later maybe got classified as Christian because um, he's always been really tight with the strong arm guys, and I think you know we've shared members or whatever. But oh no, the the band, um, I mean, can't be a 
it can't be a Christian band if I'm in it and I'm writing lyrics. <laughs> well, there you go. That, that, that answers that. <laughs> uh, so uh, during this time you know, with the Thialu demo, uh, the demo got in the hands of uh, someone who was with Revelation Records who, uh, and then at that, at that time, uh, what was going through your head, you know, when you have a, a label, you know, probably one of the largest labels independently of, you know, punk and hardcore music that's been around for so long, you know, what was going through your head at that time when there was interest from a label like that to, to put out records from Shahilud? The interest was really exciting uh, and flattering and made me feel like, man, we're like creating something that's of a quality that Revelation Records is interested in it. That's wild. You know, because you, you still don't know. You're like, you're in the band, so you don't really know what you sound like to other people. Um, but you just sort of assume you're kind of like, we're just, a, we're just a local band, you know? By this time next year, I'll be like three bands removed from this one, you know? Um, so it just didn't, it didn't really, uh, it, it, it felt significant. It was really cool. It also was really scary because uh, <clears throat> we did not get along at all. <laughs> so it was a very volatile um, band interpersonally. And uh, I think when when that interest came and <clears throat> with it, the prospect of uh, touring and, you know, being on the road and in a van with these guys, uh, I think that probably scared all of us. Um, so I was like, hey guys maybe i shouldn't and they were like yeah you're probably right and that and so that was it i handed over my folder of uh lyrics and doodles and you know whatever uh artwork kind of shit and and um parted ways what was it just personality conflicts or just conflicts of interest creatively like do you remember what the root of some of the some of the situation was what was in I don't remember what the deal was exactly with Jason and, and Matt, uh, but Jason ended up leaving because he felt like um, Matt was maybe just kind of intense and, and inflexible um, on, a, on a music kind of level. Uh, I think with me, it was probably just more personality. Um, I was just volatile and sort of, uh, you know, trigger happy kind of like I, there was yeah I, I was I was I was always ready to like argue and fight and uh, I think um, yeah I think between me just being sort of a a hot-headed kind of uh, unstable dick and him being uh, <laughs> to Jason's point pretty inflexible and immovable with his uh, vision which in retrospect, I mean, you can see that kind of, uh, yeah, he 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 uh, he wanted to direct, produce, edit, and write, you know, and just do it all. Right. And, and it's worked very well for him. He's he's one of the most talented people I've ever played with. Um, I don't think that that's really a a dynamic that the rest of us really knew how to how to how to do. And it was kind of crazy how long it took for the songs that you were on to see the light of day on the retrospective that came out, what, a couple of years back, something like that, right? Came out in the, I think it was the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I don't yeah. know why I thought it was more recent, but yeah, you're, you're probably right, yeah. Yeah, so it had been like I don't know seven years maybe, which but uh, but back then I mean you're still young enough that uh, seven years feels like a long time. Now tell me something that happened seven years ago happened last year and I'd be like okay, right? But yeah, <laughs> yeah. At the time, it was like uh, it felt like you know decades had passed. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And then Chad Gilbert, young mm -hmm. young teenage kid who. Uh, came after you and I had read, you know, and it's out there that uh, you brought Chad in. Is that correct? Uh, 
I think I embellish that because I think it's fun to take credit for it. Um, I partly did. I I think that um, Matt already had a friendship with Chad because of the strong arm circle that Chad was also in. So I think they they were part of the same friend group. Um, we all became aware at the same time that Chad had some fucking pipes on him. And that was actually at that weird show that I mentioned with discount donut run and tension. Uh, he, I remember seeing him singing along to tension and, uh, and just being like, Holy shit, how old is that little kid? Um, I think we all were like, wow. You know? Uh, so when I left, uh, I, I said to them, um, if you guys were smart, you'd get that little Chad kid. And, um, and they did. So of course, I took the credit, <laughs> but uh, if they had any common sense, they were probably planning to ask that little Chad kid anyway, because I think everybody was just like, do you hear that kid's fucking voice? Because, uh, yeah, boy can scream. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And the funny story around around when he was a singer is, like, I knew you were the singer once upon a time, but this was obviously before the internet became what it was. So to find things out, it took longer to get information. And I remember I went to a movie at the Coral Square Movie Theater in Coral Springs and Chad was working the concession and he told me he was in a band called Shy Halut. I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't be. I thought it was uh, Damien. I'm thinking that in my head. I didn't say it out loud. And then he gave me a flyer. I think they were playing uh, with Entombed, I think. And I, I went out to that show and... There he was. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he, he was for real. So uh, were you a fan of the work he did uh, on the, uh, the 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 profound seven inch and then after uh, Compassion? I was a fan of everything I heard. I was also very good at not hearing much. Um, I, I've always like the bands that I've left, I kind of... Uh, I, you know, <laughs> nothing, uh, I just, it, maybe it's a testament to like, maybe it's a good thing I'm not in those bands because apparently I just didn't like the music enough, you know, to to continue on as a fan after being in the band. But uh, I never really listened. I mean, I've heard, I heard the Shai Halud stuff that he did, the early stuff. Um, I haven't heard that much beyond that. Uh, I've heard maybe i think the only songs the only full like complete front to back morning again songs that i've heard with kevin singing have been the ones they've done in the last few years um the last couple of like two song seven seven inches or, or uh, whatever um but at the time it was like i'm i'm out of this and now i have three new bands so i just i wasn't paying attention and you know I'm sure there was a chip on my shoulder and a little bit of that <laughs> thing, but yeah, I just didn't really, um, I, I, I didn't care enough to keep up and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you came, you came back later, uh, to guest on a shy Halud song. How did that come about? Yeah, that was, uh, Matt had this idea for that album. This was just a handful of years ago for, for that album. He had an idea for one song that was going to have as many of the, uh, <laughs> the uh, shocking amount of, of vocalists that Shai Halud has ever had uh, all on one song. So uh, that was pretty fun. Yeah. I was on there with a bunch of other guys, a couple of them I knew of the rest of them. I'm like, who, who, when, um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I was wondering, besides Chad, did you get a chance to actually meet any any, any of the other vocalists that had been with Shai Halud? No. Um, I feel like I chatted back and forth with uh, Geert, the guy after Chad, the Dutch guy. Right. Yep. Um, but I don't remember if we met in person. I think this was like in the MySpace days. Like uh, we, we were friendly for a minute, but uh, that's that's about it. And then they have they've had like Twenty cents, and I don't know who they are. Yeah, uh, no, actually, we played with them in Japan in like 2013 or 14. Culture did. Um, so they had they were the singer they had at that time, uh, Justin, I believe. Um, 
that's a singer I met, but I think he was maybe only in the band for that tour. I don't know. I don't know. Matt Fox moves in mysterious ways. I don't really know how else <laughs> all that stuff works. Someone sent me the other day, actually, the, like the Wikipedia, you know, those, those bar charts that they do of like members. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Someone sent me the Shia Lud one and I was like, Holy shit. It's yes. so worse than I imagine, you know. And I remember, like, at some point, the vocalists, which were like one color line, sometimes they're doubled up. Where it's like, wait, the drummer was singing on these records, or and then this other drummer was singing on this record, and the third drummer was singing, and then the bass player. I don't know. I don't know what they, uh, how they do it. Maybe someday I'll uh, have Matt Fox on the podcast and he can talk he about it a little he bit. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a, sounds like a good idea. Uh, another band that came after uh, out of Florida that I'm also a big fan of, Birdaville Omen. What do you remember about being a part of that band? Uh, I don't remember how it started, but I remember uh, really liking it. I was listening to a lot of um, like His Hero Is Gone and Dystopia and um shit like that so we were just trying to just write something just way more dark and unhinged than some of the more controlled metallic hardcore stuff that we had been playing in other bands and um and it was the shows were kind of uh were pretty the handful of shows that i played with bird of Aloman were probably uh the craziest handful of shows i've ever played um, not because of crowd size or, or even reaction, but, uh, we would just, um, just completely fully give ourselves, you know, to the, to the vibe and, um, and it would get really chaotic and really violent and, and, um, yeah, it was a good time. Were, were you still vegan straight edge at that time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we would do, uh, I remember there was a show at, at Club Q that erupted into a riot. Um, they started, they told us to shut it down and we wouldn't. So they started trying to turn off mics and I was like ripping mics off of drums, you know, and then the sound guy would be like, oh, that's number uh, seven. And he'd look for seven to shut it down. And then I grab like five out of the kick drum and I'm you know, screaming in it until, um, and then by the time uh, there were no more mics, uh, we were basically like, you know, fuck it up and and the place <laughs> and then they were like you know i would i would i choked a guy at cheers once uh with the mic cord and then um a couple minutes later i woke up on my back on the stage because he got me and choked me um what did he do to warrant you to put the mic cord I around him I think he just, he thought it was great. He was like, oh, this is so much fun. He choked me. I'm Now I'm going to, you know, like, while he's like laying on the stage, I'm going to crawl on top of him and just fucking choke his like, life out of him. And uh, so, yeah, I remember like waking up and it was like a weird time travel thing because that we were like not in the song, where I was in the song all of a sudden. I was like, you know, how do we get to the bridge? Right. Um, that was weird. And then... Uh, there was an incident at the schoolhouse in, in Vero Beach uh, where um, I started fighting somebody while we were playing. And yeah, there was just a lot of, it was a pretty chaotic, uh, chaotic band. It was fun. What was the worst injury that you ever had when you were on stage? Uh, you know, I don't think I've had too many. I I, I remember I, like I have a crown on this on 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 a front tooth from an old bike thing when I was a kid. Um, I knocked that out at a show once in, in Vero, uh, and then I remember like in between songs asking people to look around for a tooth, and um and my friend. <laughs> and I, and I, I remember just like looking. I've heard at people it. be like, "Hey, I lost my shoe, but my tooth." <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, hey, if everybody can look around the th 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 tooth. And, you know, she found the tooth and handed it to me. And I, I, I like stuck it back up there. And I remember for like three years, it didn't budge. I could buy wow. apples and just bite trees or whatever. And nothing would happen. Did you ever go to your dentist after to get it checked out? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. 
they should at least that was responsible. Oh no, not after that. that <laughs> Once it finally came off years later. Oh wow. Okay. Wow. That's funny. Yeah. Very funny. Uh, you mentioned Club Q, and I think you know personally for myself, growing up in South Florida at that time, Club Q was my personal CBGBs. Uh, that's where I would go and see the most shows. And that was like where to go uh, any day of the week, whenever there was a show, get down to Davey and go to Club Q. So that was the first time that I saw As Friends Rust was at Club Q. And what are some of your other memories of, of, of playing there? Because it was such a synonymous place uh, in the you know mid, late 90s, early 2000s that bands would play, you know, locally, nationally, but especially locally. You know, my experiences there were not many or, or particularly great. Um, they started doing shows a little bit more regularly, kind of toward the, like, I guess sort of at the same time as Cheers, but maybe uh, while that scene was like starting to wind down at Cheers a little bit. So at the time, like, I, I remember playing there maybe once with uh, the first As Friends Russ lineup. And then, yeah, with Bird of Loman, uh I don't know that I ever played there with Morning Again. And then I moved out of out of South Florida. Um, so right around that time where I think Club Q was starting to become like a really regular, like shows were happening, starting to happen there more frequently, um, is when I moved to, to Gainesville. So... I played there a few times um, while living in Gainesville. Uh, Shai Hulu, or sorry, uh, as French Rust would come down and play. Uh, we played Club Q, I think, a couple a couple of times. Um, the second incarnation, the, the Gainesville uh, incarnation, or the, came down a couple times and played. And then I think uh, also. Um, 99 or 2000 or 2001 um i got together with the some of the early morning again guys and we did those early songs uh under the name hand of hope or or the cleanest war or something um and that was at a uh, there was a club Q set i think yeah so i was at that show it was uh basically members of morning again playing hand of hope right. like th that era <clears throat> yeah. yeah that was a great show that was one of those shows I remember feeling like at, at that moment, like this is a band from out of town that came to play. At least that's how it felt. But obviously that wasn't the case. You guys were local. So uh, what brought you to Gainesville? Uh, culture. I, so I, I went, I went to Europe with culture in 97. And when I came back, I was like, that's it. That's all I want to do now. Um, so uh I got to move to Gainesville. And so I, yeah, um, at that point I was only in Bird of Um, I left Bird of Loman, moved to Gainesville, um, and focused on culture, but also, uh, pretty soon after Gainesville, like the following year, um, started a new lineup of As and Rust with, with the first lineups permission. <laughs> um, Actually, the culture guys uh, were really into the As Friends Rust demo. And they're like, what's going on with this band? And mm. the last we broke up. And um, and those guys were like, fuck, man, I want to play these songs. They're so good. Like, I'd love to do a band like this. Ask those guys if you can start, like, As Friends Rust back up, but with new people. And I did. And they were like, yeah, we don't care. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the beginning i think like the real beginning of as friend trust not not the actual beginning but somehow the real beginning uh which became you know all this blabbing later uh my main band um, so that was like an hour and a half long uh setup for uh for it was. yeah i know <laughs> i know we had it, it, it kind of reminded me of like the build-up to uh the big takeover from bad brains to slow <laughs> slow it keeps building keeps building and all of a sudden down 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 here we are as friends rust so yeah. my personal favorite band you've ever been in uh as friends rust 
Uh, I mean, I like the hardcore stuff, don't get me wrong, but there was something different, something a bit more palatable for myself when it came to Ask Friends Russ, because you, gotta just, you know, you, you always had this style where you would, you would do the screamy stuff and then you would sing and then you would like talk sing, like you would talk mm -hmm. lyrics and what have you. And just, I felt like it really came more together in Ask Friends Russ for me and uh, the live shows, seeing you guys play live was like, man, these guys are so good. Uh, so talk about as friends rust, uh, maybe, uh, what do you remember about the first show you guys ever played? Uh, the first show, the first lineup played when I was still in Miami, um, in, in this would have been 96 was, um, there was a Pixies tribute show at cheers where a bunch of local bands were going to play on one shared, um, set up back line. Um, and each band could do two songs. Uh, so we had been practicing, we had songs, but I was like, that's my favorite band. I want to, I want to do this thing. Do you guys like, are you guys cool with it? And they were like, sure, pick two songs and we'll learn them. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first, the first As Friends Rush show. We didn't play any As Friends Rush songs. We played two Pixie songs, uh, on, you know, on, a on, a the same set that every other band that played that night shared. Um, so I, I, as soon after that, I think, I don't know if it was the first as friends, like proper as friends rush show, but also at cheers. I remember playing, uh, we played with shift. Um, and I think Ed Matusa's struggle, maybe, um, we played the patio of the edge, uh, I don't remember what the first one was really, but it was, it was a handful of, I think we played maybe like six or seven times with that lineup um, before it ended. And then 98, the, the new lineup starts um, basically like culture guys uh, sort of honeymooning as, as friend trust guys. Um, and, uh, and then, and then culture broke up. Uh, after our second tour of Europe in 98. Um, I started drinking soon after that. So kind of hard to be in a, in a, in a straight edge band at that point. So culture ended. And um, as friends, Rust was really starting to pick up uh, anyway. We had put out uh, that 10 inch, uh, The Fist of Time in that time, which was only one song from the new guys and four from the old guys, but at least they were collected and something was out. And then very quickly, we just kind of dove right into uh, um, that. That was the most that I toured for for the next three years. I would say we we toured uh, a lot, um, U.S. And, and and Europe. Talk about the writing process for some of the early Ask Friends Just material because I felt like like there were hooks and there were catchy sing along parts, uh, which I felt like was a contrast to some of the other stuff you'd been in. So. What was uh, the songwriting process like for, you know, both the early period of the band, but also what came in the next phase of Ask Friends Rust? Uh, the, the first lineup, I remember uh, Henry uh, Olmino, he was the main songwriter and he came from a place like he wasn't a hardcore kid. Um, he was kind of a like an epitaphy pop punk sort of guy who was also kind of into um, the, the like early and mid nineties kind of um, emo stuff that was happening. So I think he, I remember he loved like a, a strung out. So I think there was like, there was, there was sort of a strung out meets like, Sam I am meets split lip or end point. I don't know. There, it, it was, it still, it had a little bit of a metallic kind of lickiness to it. Yeah. Um, but it was like pretty, but dark, but punk, you know, and I don't know. It was, uh, it was, it was kind of moody and it, it uh, yeah, I really liked it for that reason. I liked it because it reminded me of, of Sam I am and split lip, which were two bands that I kind of loved at the time. Um, the second lineup uh was was kind of weird because the songwriting um it was more about i think 
we wanted to try to do something like the first lineup because I mean we're we're keeping the name right so we we, we want to adhere to a certain sort of uh style or strain of of melodic hardcore um but we also we had different influences because now like one of the guitarists listens to like tons of lifetime and uh bass players and the you know super chunk and like there so it, so it started getting a little sloppier um but also a little bit more kind of um in my mind, it was like somewhere between like Dag Nasty and Super Chunk or something. Like, you know, we we liked having that sort of uh, noisy, feedbacky kind of dinosaur junior rock kind of uh, guitar in this, but then also like we wanted to play fast, uh, like bands like uh, Gorilla Biscuits or Dag Nasty or, or, or Lifetime or whatever. Um, so that was kind of a uh, that was that lineup. Um, and then, uh, and then the third lineup, um, that was, uh, in, in 2000, that second lineup that we had been doing like a lot of that touring with for a couple of years sort of exploded. And, uh, Joe, the guitarist and I continued on with a, with a third incarnation of the band, uh, new drummer, new second guitarist, new bass player. And, um, that band was like that lineup was much more prolific we did the one uh album and then the the final uh release was a five song ep on uh equal vision the lp was on doghouse and then the ep was on equal vision records um we wrote that stuff very quickly better quality recordings i think than the previous lineups um but the music was starting to move in directions that i didn't really care for i think some of the newer members were into like you know, Incubus and maybe maybe dabbling in a little new metal and, you know, starting to get a little more uh, um, commercializable rock station kind of stuff, um, which I combated uh, vocally. Um, I, I felt, I remember feeling like the music was meant to be pulling me into these like radio sort of like pop kind of chunky heavy pop punk songs you know um and i remember like doing my best to uh not comply vocally um which was just a reflection of my my distaste for the uh, not the music so much i liked the music that they were writing but like the intent i didn't i didn't like the the aspiration you know um was the aspiration like, like, you think do you think the aspiration was to get noticed by a larger label? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because by this time, we're now entering that weird phase of like, um, this is around like 2000, 2001. So now, this was to me, this was like a really terrible time uh, for melodic rock and roll-y kind of hardcore. Um, and it was the time where bands like Thursday and Thrice and all those bands were being gobbled up by, you know, like, like um, th there was a little bit of a sort of frenzy for that style of band, because I think it was like something new to play with for, for bigger labels and um, anything that had been interesting to me uh, and not stigmatized or, or, or shameful about like emo, which it, it's hard to even, say that now and, and think that there was a time where it was like kind of cool um those days were sort of gone like uh, all of that slick radio like like nothing against these bands they've all got some 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 heaters for sure but like with jimmy world kind of like this new era of melodic kind of uh stuff dawned and i think there were some people in that third lineup of as friends russ that really wanted to go there like we were touring with further seems forever um there was there were comments about like you know incubus being an influence and it was like the fuck happened to my band um <laughs> don't get me wrong i listened to some terrible shit and i listened to a lot of like very popular terrible shit i did not listen to that terrible shit um and uh so i didn't like that one bit i just wanted to write fast melodic hardcore songs that i i wanted people to be like yeah you guys kind of remind me of of uh turning point or dag nasty 
I didn't want people to be like, remind me of Boy Sets Fire or, or you know, Thrice. Um, again, not, nothing against those bands. Do do you? Um, but that wasn't right. me. I never liked that. Yeah. And I was kind of caught in this weird bind because I was always playing in bands that were of a certain sound and to an audience that was of a certain taste. Uh, when I didn't necessarily, like, I liked melodic hardcore, but I didn't like the melodic hardcore scene that I had found myself in suddenly. Um, you know, and same thing with, like, I liked heavy hardcore, but at a, after a while, I was like, I don't want to play in front of a bunch of, like, you know, just angry white, you know, uh, like, you know, hardline uh, white guys. Uh, it just gets old, you know, and you're like, okay, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was cool. It's not for me. And now I feels like a little bit stuck. So I remember like a lot of my, my latter years touring regularly in hardcore bands, um, loving the music we were playing, loving being on stage and playing, not connecting one bit to the general surrounding scene at the time, the bands that we would be billed with just, it just wasn't. It wasn't for me. What do you think it was about the As Friends Rust sound that made the band perhaps, I don't know if I want to use the word popular, but you all definitely seem to have a lot more uh, notoriety in that band. Maybe more people knew As Friends Rust casual fans maybe more palatable i don't know but what do you think it was that brought more people into the as friends rust circle than, than maybe in some of the other bands you did before that uh well it, it is a lot more palatable in the sense that like there are there are melodies and there are hooks and and uh the vocals are are a little bit um cleaner and more comprehensible you know it, it, it's it wasn't just a bunch of like um, you know, uh, Slayer riffs and, and pterodactyl screaming, you know, it was, um, it was actually like, Hey, this is like, this is fun. And, and it was fun in a way that like, uh, it had melody and it had hooks and, and it was fun in a way that like, I think still felt guys didn't feel like we were like, you know, I think at the time there were a lot of bands that played music that like people would be like, oh, they're just, you know, they're playing that music to get girls. It's like, you're like really laying it on a little thick with the like sappy, sad boy shit, right? Um, we didn't go that far. We had melody, but like so did bands like, you know, any band from like Big Drill Car to, uh, you know, uh, Peg Boy. Like there was, there was always... Um, a melodic component happening maybe not in every scene um but there were always bands that like really emphasized melody more but still managed to be hardcore punk bands mm -hmm. yeah. that was the balance i wanted to uh to to strike and when it started losing when the scale started tipping is when i started kind of just being like ah, i don't it's just losing its edge but I, I think i think the reason that people like as friends rust is um it's uh it's not off-putting musically. It's not dogmatic or self-righteous. It's actually pretty self-deprecating. Um, and I think it's just, generally speaking, it's a little bit more um, honest or relatable lyrically than the other stuff. Uh, the, the, the previous bands, there was a lot of like finger pointing, pointing at the world, you know, and just like scolding, lambasting, condemning you know like um everything around me uh which which was you know to some extent a reflection of i guess kind of just how i felt about myself at the time and by the time um i started kind of changing my lyrical approach like with as friends rust is it probably just coincided with me being a lot more honest with myself about like like yeah dude how about you reel it back a little bit and pay a little attention to like yourself because you're a fucking mess so 
It sounded like you were being, it it sounded like maybe you were more vulnerable at that time too, with the way you were writing your lyrics, at least from an outsider looking in, like, for example, a song like home is where the heart aches. Talk about that song is because that, that for me, that's, that's, sounds like a very deep song lyrically but i don't know maybe it's maybe it's not for you because you wrote the lyrics to that song right yeah yeah it it was and and it was um it might have been sort of the tipping point for me actually that where my approach did shift and i started just kind of like um it got a little more introspective and a little bit more like i'm starting to confront the things that have like made me so angry all these years and just you know um I I was also I think from probably like 95 to uh shit probably like 2000 2001 um severely depressed um and not not talking to anybody not you know taking meds not really handling it in in any kind of uh not treating it in any way. Um, So hence the years of like really rocky (laughs) kind of friendships and relationships and, uh, and, and, uh, and I guess, um, yeah, just starting to sing more about like my own shit, because I think it just started to, to build it to the point where like I had to, uh, I had to start addressing it and being in a band that was a little more, it felt like a the the melody, the accessibility. It just felt like a better vehicle for um, more introspective lyrics. Which going back to my affinity for bands like uh, Dag Nasty or or you know like bands like that, um, Sam I Am. Uh, I remember like uh, relating always to Sam I Am lyrics because there was there was something like kind of sad and dark uh, under all that melody. Uh, so yeah, I, I think um, that song was kind of the first song where I was just like, I'm going to like turn the mirror inward, you know, um, for a while. And then, uh, and As Friends Trust continued to do that. You know, we we would have songs where we would sort of, sort of parody suburban, you know, suburban white kind of uh, the, 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 the moral majority or whatever and so there was still a little bit of that of course we're punk band right um but uh there were it was just a lot more yeah to your point i think a lot more vulnerable a lot more exposed um i hope never to the point i I think i was always a little self-deprecating and a little cheeky to the point where like maybe to save myself from being completely embarrassed about the lyrics I'd, i'd make little jokes you know in the songs and uh I think it just made the whole thing very approachable to people, very accessible. I think they appreciated that, like, we were singing about things that not every band was, certainly not that our previous bands had. And um, and I think just in a, in a narrative style that just felt sort of, like, disarming and relatable. I would agree. I think that's what resonated, you know, especially for myself personally, listening to those songs and, and the lyrics behind it. And, uh, on the eight inch record up there, the self-titled one that was on, on, on dog house. Uh, and there's some great hits on that record. <laughs> that's for yeah, sure. That's for sure. Kind of, to us, that's still that, those, that batch of songs in that era, that was the second of the three incarnations. That was really sort of the core lineup, or we always refer to it as the coffee black uh, lineup um, because of the song from, from that era. But yeah, that just, that was a, that was a special time for the, for the band. And also I think it just happened to coincide with, um, some really like formative or emotional years for us uh, in terms of like what was going on in our own lives. Um, So yeah, we just, there, there are a couple of of years where like the bonding and the memories are just like really intense. It's probably an age thing at a certain age, you, you know, you, the stuff imprints more on your 
mind or your emotional uh, uh, map or whatever. But um, those were the years. And and for whatever reason, we're sort of uh, always uh, sort of bound to each other a, a little bit, that lineup. When I saw you guys play with that lineup, I remember out of all the songs, the 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 sing along part that everybody just got wild for was and the football season is the oh, only yeah. reason you stay alive in your primetime beehive. What was it about that line? Because it couldn't just have been me. I'm sure you noticed it too, that people would just really come alive for that part of the song. You know what it was? Repetition. <laughs> That's it. Over, you, you say it over and over. You're going to line that dumb. You say it enough, and everyone's going to be <laughs> singing along. Uh, that goes back to the sort of trash your cross, God framed me thing. That was me just being like, ah, okay, so that works. And then, uh, yeah, just trying to build in. Um, we played a song, a show in in Europe, New Year's Eve when it turned 1999. So we went on, we, we were the midnight band. We went on like at, you know, 1145 or something. And we got to ring in the new year in the, in the middle of our set. And, um, and we played Coffee Black for the first time in Europe. Uh, nobody knew the song. Uh, and that was sort of the perfect test of like, they don't know it, but will they in like one and a half minutes? And so we had a couple of guys um, who were with us we one of them on a, on a piece of cardboard it said end the football season and the other guy is the only reason and then the first guy would flip his sign you stay alive and the second guy would flip his sign in your prime type vive and they did that on the first chorus and after that it was just like just exploded I, it was you know it was a it was kind of a it was a big show it was like a kind of a day fest or something so it it felt like all the people in that room, you know, like 1500 people or something um, <laughs> were screaming that chorus. Uh, Cause you know, we, we flashed, we flashed the, uh, the teleprompter up for them and they got it and that was it. And it was just like, it, it already, and it, it still to this day is probably our, our, our craziest response when we play live is still for that song. Oh, wow. like, when you, were, when you were when exactly you were writing that, that song, <laughs> when you were writing that song, did you have any inclination like that would become the 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 main uh, sing along at some of the Ask Friends Rush shows, both then and even no. even you know if you played a show right now, that would be the one, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, had no idea. Um, <laughs> and, and it, it and it because it's a it's kind of dumb with, I've also always done like sort of stupid things with as friends, Russ lyrically, where I sing about like um, in that song, like family feud, right. Or, or wheel of, I think family feud and wheel of fortune, maybe. Yes. Both of those are brought up in that song. Yeah. And then later in as friends, Russ on the last EP, uh, there are songs like there, there's one song where I, um, Joe always jokes about how we're probably still the only band that's ever used Tupperware <laughs> in the lyrics. We got Tupperware, AstroTurf, blow up dolls, uh, Ziploc, you know, like all in, in one, in one bag. So it, it, in one song, it, I think it was just, just being sort of, I don't know, just not really worrying about if it was weird, uh, just doing what felt right and doing it confidently. And people seem to, People seem to like it. What exactly is Coffee Black about? Uh, Coffee Black is really just about kind of the 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 hordes of sort of suburban uh, the people who, when they say, um, you know, it's a safe neighborhood, they mean it's a white neighborhood, like those kind of you know just church going, law abiding, prime time TV watching, uh, TV dinner kind of. Um, I guess it's, I don't even know if it's really a a, a stereotype or, or an archetype that lives anymore. But at the time, it was that sort of suburban, you know, 90s, 80s, kind of that, it was that image. So uh, it, the, that part actually doesn't mean anything. It was just like, it just worked with the cadence. You like your coffee black, your neighborhood's white. Uh, your, your lights are out at, uh, your lights are out at nine o'clock at night or whatever it is. 
Um, so it's really, it was just sort of the setup for this uh, type of person, household kind of uh, conservative kind of um, boomer type that's just not willing to kind of learn about the world around them anymore, you know, and I, the coffee black thing is like, it's become such a thing for us where people are like, are you drinking your coffee black? And I'm like, why would I'm not that guy, you know, but then I also <laughs> do drink my coffee black. And then I'm like, oh shit, am I racist? Cause I'm drinking coffee black. Cause the guy in my song that drinks black coffee is racist. And you know, <laughs> it's, but it's become this weird like point of like analysis for a lot of people. And, uh, and I'm just like, it just, uh, that's just how the line came out. Mm. I've always just preferred my coffee black. I'm not a fan of cream and sugar in my coffee. So yeah. Yeah. No, it was just for the contrast. You like your yeah. coffee black. Right. <laughs> yeah uh great song though and i'm just lyrically i think if i just saw it on paper wouldn't pick that song as like the one of the main sing-alongs at a live show but man, it is and it gets everybody going and uh great stuff great great recording uh and selfishly you know we had to spend a lot of time on ask friends rust uh, i mean for all the right reasons of course but personally one of my favorite bands not just that you've been in but just in florida from florida in general yeah, yeah. so uh great stuff uh you also were in a band after as friends ross with uh bill clower the drummer from radon i know bill's been on a ton of gainesville yeah. gainesville bands that was a uh, bridge burner is that right yeah, that was that was during as friend Russ oh, toward, uh, toward the very end of that second lineup. Um, just as it was starting to fall apart, we did this sort of um, joke record, eight song record. Uh, Bill Clower on drums, uh, Caleb from as friends Rust on bass, uh, myself singing, and then this guy Eric who had been in a, a hardcore band called Speak Seven One Four, another Revelation band. With, uh, one of Dan O'Mahony's um, many bands. Uh, we met him in in Europe. He was living in Amsterdam at the time, and then just did this thing kind of through the mail. And we did a tour. Uh, we toured Europe with with Fall Silent at the end of a at the end of an As Friends Russ tour. But that's about as far as that band went. Um, the record came out. Nothing happened with it, and we we moved on. Were you? well versed in the Gainesville scene prior to moving that way and then while you were there were you familiar with a lot of the bands and clubs that were up that way uh, no uh prior to moving up there well I started going up all the time to practice uh with with culture once they moved up um until I finally moved but no it was kind of a foreign scene to me um I knew like Tom Petty was from there and I knew uh what are they called? Four squirrels. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really know too much outside of that or outside of the guys that like the the culture guys who were already living there. Um the the people they knew like they knew the you know hot water music guys or or Sean Toy Box Records was living in Gainesville. So those people I met kind of through the culture guys, but uh, it wasn't really on my radar at the time because, again, I was kind of like central and south Florida and then outside of Florida. But I guess I kind of I didn't know much about uh, Gainesville. What about what was going on in the other scenes at the same time period, like in Tampa? You know, so there was a big uh, screamo scene going on. There were other bands that weren't playing that style of music, but did you have any uh, knowledge of what was going on there and any chance to see any of those bands in that area? Yeah, I, I, um, I liked uh, a lot of that stuff. I, I actually always kind of liked like like bands from san diego the like gravity kind of bands and ebullition records kind of bands. so i really vibed with the kind of hardcore that they were starting to do in tampa um it was getting a little bit more um just kind of um uh, yeah political kind of uh more um 
screamo y or whatever, but like I liked I liked some of what they were doing. There was a bit of a culture clash between culture and uh and some of that scene, the reversal of man guys. I remember like there there was some stuff that um I wasn't present for, but it 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 certainly um caused kind of a rift between your your more uh um victory style kind of straight edge kids and then and those kind of hardcore kids uh like the the white belts we would call them um with the you know spock haircuts and and shit and uh so no i didn't really have much of a connection to those bands or those scenes i liked what they were doing um whether i could admit it or not at the time uh, i liked what they were doing i liked tampa bands before before them um i i love failure face that's one of my favorite local bands um or florida bands um i liked uh this is a little bit before my time but i liked awake uh, a lot that awake seven inch has gotten a lot of play uh over the years slap of realities you know some of some of those bands um yeah yeah slap of reality definitely uh one of my favorite bands of from the state of that time period uh they were kind of like that kind of post hardcore yeah kind of sound yeah. i felt like so um interesting though about the the culture <laughs> i know yeah. that that's a good pun though too <laughs> the culture clash between uh the two different uh i guess you know culture and some of the what was going on up in the tampa area but mm -hmm. uh so after as friends russ was kind of because did you all officially like did you officially like leave the band and and at that point like we're because you said bridge burner and as friends russ kind of overlapped so when did you leave as friends rust bridge burner and the 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 end of the second incarnation of as friends rust overlapped and then Bridge burner just sort of dissolved after that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was really to be a, a, a thing anyway. Um, and then we started the third incarnation of As Friends Rust, which went until uh, 2002. And um, yeah, so we recorded the one LP, then we recorded that Equal Vision uh, five song EP. I quit before it, again, before the <laughs> record was actually like uh, even shipped to us. Uh, I was out of the band. And then they they continued for a, for a little bit in 2002 under the same name with another singer or maybe two singers. Um, I think they had to fulfill some some touring obligations that were already booked that, uh, as I understand it, I bailed on. Um, I think they intended to to keep it going, but I don't think it was um, met with. I, I think they just thought better of it after doing a couple of tours with other singers. They were just like, let's just give this up and start something new. Were people pissed off that it was someone else singing? Like, did you hear stories from uh, as time went on that people were mad that it wasn't you? I've heard a couple of stories about people like, you know, they'd be like, what's up, we're as friends Rust? And somebody in the back just being like, no, you're not, you know, <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I don't, I think for the most part, people, um, people understand like shit happens. And I think that, uh, maybe it's not what they were expecting to see, but they were still stoked to hear the songs that they liked. And I'm sure they survived, you know, uh, well enough, those, those sets. Um, but yeah, I, I, I saw them play with, uh, Adam was the guy who replaced me. who's was like one of the nicest guys ever. And, um, I didn't think it was bad at all. Uh, but it definitely was not as friends rust as, as I'm sure he probably knew himself. Yeah. I yeah. Just a certain sort of, uh, um, voice and by voice, I guess I kind of mean like ca character, um, that, uh, in that band is, is just not really like count counterfeitable, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think I think it's probably the only I don't even know that I would say this about Damien Dunn, which which started as my solo solo project. But I think as Friends Rust might be the only band that like it's gotta be me singing in it. Or yeah. just like the band. Um 
and yeah, again, my my solo shit, you could probably find somebody else to say, pop slide right in there, and and it'd be the same or better. But I think as friends, Rust is like the, it's it's not that I have a, a great voice. It's just that that the the character in that band is yeah very much mine. My, my, you know, I would completely agree. This the entire package, like the the live shows, I think we're on a whole different level than just listening to it in the studio he's and you brought it you know you brought it to the and just looking at the photos of yourself from that period like just the intensity on your face like man like you can't really describe it like you you had to have been there to, to see the band play especially back in that period you know when obviously we know we're all younger right so you could do things probably uh you know uh that might hurt today but maybe i don't know but uh yeah i was like it was a, just a the whole the whole package for sure uh was that when you took a hiatus was after you left fast friends rust yeah uh mostly i i left early 2002 and then um i started trying to just go to school you know was living with my girlfriend at the time was just trying to like work and I, I don't know, be like, a do whatever I thought I maybe was supposed to be doing, uh, at that age instead of touring. Um, I did start writing the Damien Dunn songs, uh, kind of right after that, because, um, my girlfriend at the time played guitar and she had a guitar in the house and, uh, and I started just kind of messing around with it and wrote the, the early, um, the first recording of, of, Damien Dunn recording, which I did the next year in 2003. Um, but even that was more just like, it was more just, I wanted to see if I could write a song, like on an instrument, which I had somehow like managed to avoid ever touching uh, my whole, my whole like life or or career or whatever, uh, screaming, I just never really uh, touched any a guitar, or, you know, uh, any real, real instruments. So it was more of a challenge where I was like, I still want to make music. I don't want to be in a band anymore. Um, I'm just going to start. I'm going to see if I can write a couple of songs and see if they're good enough. And if they're good enough to bother recording, maybe I'll go record. Um, so I pulled five songs together and recorded them in 2003. And, uh, and then nothing ever happened with that until 2016. Um, but basically, after that recording, that sort of marked the beginning of my, I'm not in bands, I'm on a hiatus, I'm just a dude with a job and a girlfriend. And um, if I have any uh, song ideas, I guess I'll just turn my computer on and try to get them in garage band or something and, uh, and just go on with my life. And I did that until uh, like for a long, long time. Yeah. What, what what did you miss most during that time from some of your early years? Nothing, nothing. I was totally soured uh, to the whole thing at that point. I think I, w I still had a chip on my shoulder because I felt like this band that was super important to me was sort of hijacked um, by, you know, by, by a, an organization with a different agenda. So I was still a little salty about that and i was probably mad at myself for the role that i played in the lineup before that lineup leaving you know um so yeah i think i just kind of was like i don't know i don't remember i don't remember ever thinking i'm never going to do another band again but i also don't remember ever thinking eventually i'll start another band i think it was just maybe um it just was, it was just completely purged from my brain. Uh, that's kind of the way that I have to deal with things is like, um, I think I just compartmentalized it. Uh, all of those, all of that stuff, all of those years, just closed the door on it and just kind of, you know, went about my life. Are there certain people from those periods that you've remained close with over the years? The periods of not playing music? Just during that time, like when you when when you weren't playing, like were there certain people in some of the bands that 
before that some of your early bands that you were able to they that, that you wanted to keep in touch with that you would make an effort to to call or to to to, to meet up with whether the people that you kept in touch with no no i'm kind of realizing that uh no i at that point um i had moved from gainesville back to miami um i was living in coral gables and uh i was too busy just kind of um working living my life uh you know we didn't all have cell phones i think i well, i probably got a cell phone around then this is like 2004 um, but, you know, a flip phone and like we, we didn't have the access to each other um, like we had. And I wasn't living in Gainesville anymore, so I wasn't really like talking. I was still in touch with Caleb from As Friends Rust, uh, but I wasn't really in touch with any of the other guys from any of the lineups. Um, maybe the first lineup, the drummer, Matt, but uh, aside from that, it was kind of. Um, no, I just I just worked and went home and watched TV and went to bed. Um, and then uh, I'm going to fast forward up here because you're going to have so much editing to do to make this thing in <laughs> a nice manageable chunk. Uh, 2006, I moved to Michigan. Um, the relationship I'm in ends, I end up with a in a uh, long distance relationship with a girl in Michigan, travel back and forth for a year or so. And then, and then finally I moved up to Ann Arbor, which I always kind of liked. Um, and then it was 2008, uh, that we did an Ask Friends Rust reunion. And that was, uh, that was the first time I had even contemplated kind of coming back to it, you know? So we did, uh, we played a show in Gainesville and then we did a week in Europe. Um, and then we came back and we said that was so much fun. Let's do that again in a couple of years, <laughs> not too soon. Um, and let's maybe start writing some music. And uh, that was 2008. It's now 2023. And we finally recorded <laughs> uh, a new album. We just finished. Wow. Actually, in 2020, we did two songs. We, we, we did do that. Um, and, and this is all with the middle, the, the lineup from the middle incarnation, uh, the core line, the coffee black lineup. That's who's been doing all of the reunion shows and the reunion tours and went to Japan and um, did the two songs in 2020 and now is doing this new record. So it's like back to like the, uh, the yeah, the, the core team. Is the formula the same or is there something that's going to surprise the hardcore fans of the band when they hear this? I think the overall formula is the same. Uh, I've played it for a few friends and they're just like, it's As Friends Rust. And I'm like, does it sound like old As Friends Rust? Nope. But old As Friends Rust, like, I don't think any two As Friends Rust releases really sounded that similar, at least from incarnation to incarnation, the, 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 the Fist of Time stuff to the Coffee Black stuff. And then that stuff to one in the uh, last LP right. um, were pretty big jumps, but they always had melody. They always kind of uh, straddled the line between um, hardcore and punk. And I guess what some people would call emo, maybe even a little bit of metal. Um, I think in the very end of As Friends Rust, uh, sort of a, sleazier sort of rock and roll kind of a darker uh edge um that's all still there uh i think if anything it's just a little more honed in um i think the new record to me sounds um uh, more urgent um somehow a little bit slower and a little bit more melodic but also a lot more attack like the drums are just in your face and um it's uh so it ends up feeling like more energetic even if the tempos are slightly slower um it's still kind of sarcastic uh and yeah a little um i don't know scolding 
<laughs> is is the word but like when i you know there, there's 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 an even amount of kind of uh uh holding them up the mirror and 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 pointing the finger mm. and there's a lot of i would say one thing that that we started kind of doing in 2020 with one of those songs um there are a lot of open-ended uh kind of questions i think being asked in the songs like in 2020 we did one called uh last of the uh famous international scumbags um that's about should we separate the art from the artist you know <clears throat> is is there a limit like is there a threshold where beyond a certain point if the transgression is of a certain type you know of a, of a bill cosby persuasion um versus a, a you know Aziz, I'm sorry, kind of, um, where's, where, where is that line? Um, some would argue there should never be one. Uh, and other people are like, nope, I hear anything I don't like. And that guy's fucking dead to me, you know? And, uh, I think we never try to answer those questions. We just want to sort of present like both sides of the argument and just leave it as a, like, I don't know. Cause I, cause I don't know. Cause none of us know. Right. I'm still figuring this shit out. And there's some of that on the new record with like, uh, there's a song that talks about uh, on social media, if somebody posts, you know, that something terrible is happening to them or or has happened, you know, and people respond with the little react, uh, you know, the care react emoji. Um, there's a song it sounds really stupid to actually say this out loud, but there's a song about that emoji and kind of what it symbolizes, which is just this, like, there's still value in the gesture, you know? Um, there's still value in showing that, like, you took the time to read it and you took the time to respond and and show solidarity. Um, at the same time, how much solidarity you're actually showing by clicking this little thing and then just like unpausing your video game and going back to, you know, um, whatever you're doing. So it's kind of this, like, I think we're, we're just all still trying to figure it out. That's what as friends or songs are kind of about is like, what are we supposed to be doing here? Does anyone else feel like this is weird? Oh, you do too. Yeah. This is fucking super weird. Right. Are we going to talk about this? We're we just going to, you know, like, she's dying and we're going to care react and then turn around and post some like really funny meme, like two seconds later. It's just, uh, you know, um, but again, it's like, I'm not saying don't do that. Show people that you care about the stuff mm -hmm. that's going on with them. If they, you know, post something or whatever that, that, that warrants a little bit of support, you know, but at the same time, let's recognize that like, this is really kind of giving us an out from having to really be there in any substantial capacity. Um, so no answer to that. It's just kind of a, a thing that's posed. And then there's also, there's one, uh, there's one about, um, we've moved into this, this time where like everybody is an, is an activist right of some sort we were activists through our choices as consumers we're activists through you know the, the marches that we join when the shit's going down um but we're also really comfortable at home and it's like uh I, what i noticed was was um the song was prompted by my own sort of um lack of putting my money where my mouth was, where uh, I, I I attended one, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, march. And it, it was always every week. I remember every week, this was like during COVID when like the shit was really starting to, to, to you know, reach a boiling point out there um, in the streets. And like, and you want to be a part of, you want to, you want to advocate for change and you want to show up. Right. But, uh, but you're in your forties and you have a career and you have a kid and you're fucking hungry and your back hurts and you, all of these things that like, I don't know if they're excuses or if they're legitimate explanations, but basically like we're all sort of showboating 
uh, I, I think this we're we're we front, you know, we're we're um, I think often trying to like portray ourselves as as uh, bigger kind of agents of change than than our penchant for being comfortable really allows us to be. We do feel those ways, you know, we, we, we may be for this or against this or allies here or whatever. And like, and, and, uh, and, and maybe we're helping in other ways and we're donating or raising money or whatever, but like, um, there's, there's, there's a rift between how much we want to do and how much we're willing to do often. Um, that song's called, uh, no gods, some masters. Uh, just about how like it doesn't it doesn't take much to like you can put your fists in the air and, and claim to be this kind of uh, free sovereign you know sort of like uh, agent all you want but until your boss calls you then you gotta so, go. So is this new record going to be more like socio political? Uh, no, it's it's a you know it's it's going back to that thing where it's like you've got a coffee black but then you also have like a uh home is where the heart aches or skate mm -hmm. the whistle so it's sort of a mixture of of stuff that's like a little bit more um personal but yeah it's just a lot of uh it's it i i think there i think it's a little heavy on the songs that make people just go oh shit i do that mm -hmm. Oh, but you know what? He's not really like giving me shit for doing that because I also because he also does that apparently. And like, oh shit, we all do this. Do we want to talk about it and figure this out? Or is this like it's just more observational, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing the new music. When when will it be out? Any any idea timeline wise? we uh the, the the label that's putting it out seems pretty sure it'll be out by august or in august sometime which is sooner than we thought um with with final turnarounds these days but yeah so it should be august which is uh five months so that's great because the, the the newest uh damien dunn i think we're at like 15 months of waiting for this record to get to come in and it, and it won't be in until may um or maybe it'll be 15 months by the yeah. time. Uh, How do you like that? The fact that, you know, Damien Dunn seems like a, you know, a personal project, you know, band for you. And it was something that, uh, you know, quite different, a departure from your other sound and the, all, the, all the other bands that you have been in over the years, but also playing with and working on new music with a lot of people's favorite band of yours, As Friends Ross. So what is that like for you being able to do both? Um, it's great. The, the Damien Dunn stuff is really satisfying because, uh, well, it's, it's, it's mine, <laughs> you know, um, but mostly anyway, the new, the new record, actually, uh, the other guitarist, Tyler wrote, uh, the music for two of the songs, which was, that's a first for Damien Dunn, um, where I'm not, where, uh, I don't write everything. Um, so that's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, it's it's nice to just have a different outlet and be able to kind of uh, stretch some stylistic kind of muscles that I don't get to in other bands and never got to in other bands, which is basically just kind of a, a love for, um, I don't know, like darker kind of new wave stuff or uh, dark kind of rock that sort of straddled that new wave uh line to uh billy idol cult kind of stuff that's at least in my head like yeah. that's kind of what thing and done is for <laughs> maybe a little more minimal uh and stripped back but kind of it's 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 more of that uh and then the as friend draw stuff is kind of yeah. just feels good you know it's we it was starting to become sort of a laughable how long it was taking us to get this record together and then when we finally uh started hearing the mixes we were like shit this is um this feels really good these songs are are fun we're proud of them and uh it kind of just feels uh yeah feels it feels good I know we've been going for a long time here and you know what this is the 50th episode you know this is a special episode you have a lot of career to cover and 
We're halfway. <laughs> we're halfway. <laughs> we're, we're close. I think we're close. Because they're still, you know, because <laughs> although you had already moved to Michigan at this time when the ban on bodies formed, which was pretty much all Florida people, right? With the exception that you moved to, to Michigan. Am I right or wrong when I say that? Uh at a certain point, it became all Florida people. Um, but yeah, we we skipped over that. So at 2008, did the uh, As Friends Rust reunion stuff. Um, and then in 2011, I think, was when I started doing On Bodies. So that was uh, Rich Thurston from Culture. Um, he and I had been uh, estranged <laughs> for many years, and we, we reconnected and sort of buried the hatchet and uh and he sent me some some new stuff that he was writing and i was like you know what it's 2011 oh yeah i'll do a new band i haven't been in a band since 2002 you know aside from the the as the week of as friends rush shows um so at the time uh that first recording planet hospice was which is essentially a demo with a lot of songs on it um, was basically, uh, that was just Rich and I. Rich played everything and I sang. The second lineup, we decided we wanted to try playing shows. So that's when we got the guys from uh, from Florida. Um, Chip, who who had been in uh, Until the End and some other bands. Um, Julio from Glass Eater. Uh, and then Chad Kishik, who has also been in a bunch of bands um, on guitar. But still, uh, Rich wrote all of those but he went down there and they all recorded as a band. So, so that was actually like a full band recording. Um, and we played a couple of shows in South Florida with that lineup. Um, and then very soon after that, that lineup kind of fizzled and we wrote the next EP, just the two of us again, Rich and I, and Rich has been living in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, since he left Florida um, after we booted him from culture, which was, he was the last original member. And so also kind of a shitty situation there where uh, he, he's out of his own band, but he's been living in basically in Cincinnati uh, uh, ever since. And now I'm kind of a three and a half hour drive from him uh, in Ann Arbor. So it just made sense. But that was fun. We, we did three recordings. We played a couple of shows in Florida. We toured Japan and we played like Philly and New York, and that was about it. Were you were you close with the other members of On Bodies? Was it more just like looking like people to play with, and it just clicked for recording music and touring a bit? Like, were you actually close to the rest of the band members of of On Bodies? I wasn't close to. I mean, aside from Rich, no. Chip and I knew each other. Julio and I knew each other. Um, just from you know, back in the day, I guess. Uh, As friends, Russ played. Uh, a decent amount of shows with Glass Eater along the way between like fests and I think we'd always be kind of touring around the same time so a lot of our shows would overlap even in you know California or wherever so um yeah I was friends with with the Glass Eater guys so I, I knew Julio and I knew Chip uh, I didn't know Chad that well um but uh no not not really it, it okay. was it always kind of felt to me like um Rich's thing that I was singing on. Got it. And you mentioned Rich's thing, but yeah, I get what you're saying. And you mentioned festivals and you're no stranger to playing festivals. You played a lot of festivals. So thinking back in your Rolodex of festivals, is there one or two that stand out to you as some of your favorites that you remember playing? Oh, I, Yeah, uh, more recently, I would say the the As Friends Russ played Fest in Gainesville in 2015. Um, that was on Halloween night. That was a super fun um, set. There were people in like face paint and costumes and stuff in the crowd, and that was really fun. Um, the the early uh, there's a fest in Belgium called Eber Festival, um, and the first couple of times that or the first few times, I guess, that I played that. The first two were with Culture, 97 to 98. Then they changed venues. 
played there uh, with as friends Ross several times. That fest is always uh, just absolutely insane, and and our sets would be you know to the point where um, there's no stage anymore. It's just overrun. You can't tell where the kids. You know, it's basically like kids, and then and then the mass kind of gets higher and taller, and then all of a sudden uh, they're 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 on the standing on the drums. You know. Um, so those fests, I, I know a lot of bands hate that stuff. Uh, I lived for that. I, yeah, um, love that stuff. But also, you're no stranger to coming onto the floor and belting out some lyrics, right? Yeah, I mean, one of us has to go to the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you see people like, you know, reaching for the microphone, and I don't know if they're trying to just take it from you or they just want to get real close and... Uh... What does that feel like for you when you have people that are right up there with you, almost like their mouth is up against yours as you're spelting out these uh, these lyrics? It's crazy. It's still it's still every bit as crazy as it was, you know, the first time it happened. Um, it tickles that part of me that fell in love with. I, I had a visual moment with minor threat when i was young where like you see those black and white photos of uh ian mckay in the crowd on the floor right shaved head almost everybody around them's got a shaved head they're just dudes in like white t-shirts and you know chinos or jeans or whatever you know and um and they 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 looked like me and my friends um i loved that there was uh, just this total level playing field between the band and the crowd. There, were, there was no hierarchy. Um, you don't get to lord over the audience because you're a guy in a band. You're, they're probably also people in bands, you know? Um, so there, there was that sort of, uh, it, it was like a great equalizer. And I, I remember like just loving that when your whole frame of reference is is uh is you know metallica and, and iron maiden and shit um and all of these big sarah you know all, all the ritual that comes with it which is great i mean I, I still love metal um but there was something about just the immediacy and the intimacy and the the um yeah the lack of hierarchy it was a lot more uh um socialized Right. It was like the people's show. It wasn't minor threat show it was the people's show. And, you know, uh, that always stuck with me. And to this day, um, if I put a microphone out and people, you know, try to fly to it, um, it just, it, it just, it makes me feel like those images made me feel, you know, um, and I think that's kind of what's always appealed to me about hardcore, like the gang vocals. Um, it's not just a stylistic, you know, uh, trope in hardcore songs. I mean, it is it is that as well. But like the gang vocals to me just kind of uh, I hear friends, you know, I hear like I hear kids. I hear just a bunch of like like minded people uh just all sharing in the experience and, and like everybody gets a mic or everybody gathers around this one, you know? And, uh, and I just, uh, yeah, I like that. That's, that's one of the, the, those, those flagship kind of hallmark, um, attributes of, of a hardcore song that to me just feels like, um, connected. Yeah. I think the only time I ever did that at an ass friends rush show was at club Q it was Ask Friends Rust. I think it was Fast Times from New Jersey. And I think Esteem, I think may have played that show from uh, Southwest, Myers, South, Florida. from Southwest Florida. But, yeah, but, Fort Myers. Right? What's that? Yeah, they have the Fort Myers area. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anyone else played. It's not coming to me, but I remember like, I definitely remember Fast Times played because I was a fan of theirs. And, uh, I just remember that was the first time I personally 
came up to the front too. And I think, I think, I think it had, it had to have been coffee black. It had to have been because every, I feel like everybody just moved up. If you were in the back, you came to the front to get in on, 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 on that, on that book. So, uh, it was, it was, uh, just a, a, a moment that, you know, it's like, wow. But yeah, I'm usually not that guy who gets up and wants to get close to the microphone, but I did that for, I did for that, that show. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always weird to me when hardcore bands like complain about people getting up on the stage. They're like, you know, yo, if you keep doing that, we're going to stop, like stay the fuck off the stage. Yeah. So it's so weird because to me, the whole, the whole spirit uh, that you're trying to tap into with, with, uh, with hardcore songs is that sort of, you know, that connectivity, like everybody gets a, everybody gets to share in this, uh, voice and experience and, and yell along, like, you know, we made the song. That's why by default, I've got the microphone, but I don't, I don't need to hang on to this thing. It's, you know, like, I know the songs you know, the songs too. fucking sing it. I'll sing along. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And I'm sure that's that's a moment for you, you know, because I'm sure you've seen it so many times. But still, I'm sure it has some type of uh, effect when you see people come up and want to sing along, and you're like, you know, these are your words. You wrote these lyrics, and you see how passionate people are mm -hmm. about these songs. Uh, do you ever just have a moment where you kind of pinch yourself? Not, you know, physically, you know, but but you kind of in your mind pinch yourself. You're like man, I, I can't believe like this is happening still, or just you have any moments like that where you kind of yeah. reflect yeah. on it in the moment? No, all the time. I've, I've, I've never taken that piece of it for granted. Um, I, I don't think any of us in as friends rust, um, ever have like, I remember on, on that reunion tour in 2008, after one of our shows in, um, at Coney Island in, in Leipzig, uh, the show ended and people were like clapping and stuff. And I remember turning around and James, our guitarist was like with a tear in his eye, just like prostrating before the crowd, like sort of like bowing and thanking them like profusely because it was just like so moving to have people um, give a shit about, you know, something that you wrote. It's, it's crazy that like kids from, you know, these little neighborhoods or subdivisions or whatever can like um, put some songs on tape that like mean enough to people in other parts of the world to sing along to, to tattoo on themselves, to have playing at their weddings. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. it's really wild. And I, I never, uh, yeah, it's never lost on me how like insane that is how cool that is I'm a, I'm a fan of music and i know yeah. i know what it's like to feel um to have music that like other people made be so important to me and uh and it's w just so weird to think that like some of that music for other people is music i made yeah why yeah when people usually find you or chat you up on social media and such, or even maybe at a show, you know, what's the one band that brought them to you that you think that you've been in? Uh, it's almost always as for interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, people, people like, there's still a lot of people who, who love the you know the metallic stuff, morning again culture stuff, um, and you know I I I don't I'm not ashamed of any music I made at any point uh, along the the journey. I'm proud of all of it. Uh, there's a lot of it I would never care to do again. You know, at 46, I'm not trying to start a band like Vertivilla. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or it's just not in me anymore. Um, whereas as friends or us just feels like uh, we grow and it grows with us. And, and if we grow that way, it grows that way too. And if we, you know, it just, um, you, you're really kind of uh, um, tethered 
to to a sound more in kind of other types of bands where as with as friends rust it kind of felt like we could we could make some pretty sharp pivots if we wanted to and and i don't think anyone would really have much to say about it yeah i'm glad it all came back around to ask friends rust because uh like i said selfishly glad we spent a lot of time talking about that band because uh like I said, one of my personal favorite bands, uh, not just from Florida, but just in general. So hopefully, uh, I know it's, you know, everyone's older kids and what have you, but is there touring perhaps, uh, maybe possibly some we are looking dates? at touring, um, we'll be doing Europe sometime in late September, early October. Um, and then I think we're, we're starting to talk about trying to play, uh, a few shows in the in the states i'm not sure where but uh I'm, I'm sure one of them would be in florida and then maybe uh brooklyn that seems to be a, a spot for us the last few years to every now and then is the band just received better overseas that make you start off with europe and then play some shows in the u.s yeah yeah mm -hmm. we've always done better there uh being on good life being on european labels kind of right. really helped um and then uh the new record will be coming out on end hits record which is uh also a european label german label um they've done uh, uh like some shelter reissues uh hot water music voice that's fire stuff like that um so it's uh they're they're pretty pretty good label they've been around for a while um nice quality great presentation all that so we're pretty excited to do it on them but uh that nice. also brings us back to like oh i guess we're going to hear it um, yeah we, we've never really figured out in the states like where our territory was you know we didn't do enough touring of the whole country um we went with strike anywhere once we did a couple of Midwest, East Coast kind of things um, alone or with discount. Uh, but we, um, and yeah, our frame of reference for like where in the States we do well is, is uh, if anything, like going on, you know, 25 or so years old. So I don't think it would even apply anymore. Like I remember New Jersey being pretty good, but not well enough that in 2023 i'm gonna try to book a new jersey show <laughs> yeah um we've had good shows in brooklyn a couple we played uh 2015 and 2019 we did just kind of one-off shows um in in brooklyn where james um one of the guitarists lives and those were always good but i think that's because new york is like people are always looking for an excuse to go there so i'm sure that most of the people at, at those shows were were not locals I think a lot of people kind of traveled for the show yeah were you were you headlining those shows or were you opening for another band uh we were headlining those mm -hmm. well one was on our way to europe for a for a festival in 2015 so we all flew to new york practiced played a show at saint vitus and then flew to belgium um and then the other one in 2019 was yeah, it was also just a one-off, a promoter from a different club, uh, the Kingsland, asked if we wanted to play and, yeah, offered to kind of fly us out there to play and we were like, sure, yeah. And with the way you can promote now, way different, right, than back in the early years of Ask Friends Rust, uh, do you find that um, more people are finding out about shows like that and are they pretty crowded? Uh yeah yeah those shows were, were were a really nice turnout um i don't know what goes into promoting them like on the ground you know if you're if you're the guy from one of those uh things but yeah we, we you know we do our part on social media people seem seem to get uh excited and come check it out yeah i bet and it, it, that's it's it's also the one band that's just always been kind of muscle memory. So like we 
we can get together after not having played a show for five years and kind of run through the set once or twice and, and be good to go. I'm sure that helps a great yeah. deal as well. It does. It'll be harder <laughs> this year. Because I think there'll be a lot of new songs um, that we maybe didn't think think uh think about how to pull off live um but uh we'll figure it out will this be the first time that you go off on a tour like this since having a a child no i i did a damien dunn tour also of europe in 2000 summer of 2018 so my son would have been um not yet one uh so that's that was probably harder for my wife because she was still, you know, she was uh, on her own taking care of an infant for for a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, they're pretty easy at that age, right? Like aside, from, I mean, it's yeah, <laughs> not as like taxing uh, in terms of energy. Well, I guess you you're not sleeping too well, but true but when they're six, harder to you know, leave five year. yeah five six years old they're definitely more more on the go <laughs> yeah they're more on the go and they're just bigger forces in your life like you yeah know, you don't you know you miss your baby if you're away from your one-year-old but your baby's still like not really doing anything that cool yet <laughs> right so, um there's a connection that you're you you, you know um you're, you're missing a baby. You're not yeah. missing a person yet. Um, and now it's like, not only is he a person, but he's like 10 people and right. big, big presence. So I, I, yeah, I feel the, um, I, if I go to the store, I feel the absence <laughs> of him, you know? Um, I can yeah. empathize totally. Yeah. You kind of almost have this like separation anxiety feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah, so you know, it won't uh, be a big tour, but it'll be. Yeah. Huge. And, you know, with, with things that you have nowadays, you know, FaceTime or whatever, uh, you know, you can still, you know, stay connected. But at the same time, it's just not it's not the same. <laughs> so what well, super excited for what's to come and what you have going on. Uh, I know there's you know, you, you, you are a man of many bands so there's there's uh <laughs> i'm sure a lot more to come that has not even happened yet uh one you know uh so as we kind of close out the interview i know we've been at this for for quite a while but again 50th episode milestone damian moyle here on the podcast uh as friends ross one of my personal favorite bands so no apologies you know this is uh well worth the time and uh so as we kind of close things out, Damien, uh, any final closing remarks you'd like to share? Anything else we want to plug? Uh, anything else as we kind of round things out? I will turn it over to you to close out of our interview. And by the way, thank you so much, my friend, for thank taking you. the time out to to, yeah. to talk with the Force on Archive and really appreciate all the time tonight. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't really have anything to plug, you know, just, uh, yeah, new As Friends Russ coming out later this year. Uh, the album will be called Any Joy. Um, new Damien Dunn coming out in May. That's called Total Power. Uh, and then I'm doing a, a death metal band um, with a couple of friends. And we're working on a record uh, also. Should be out sometime this year. That, that band is called Ecstasis, E-K-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S -S. Uh, you can find us at Ecstasis Death on all your social places. Um, yeah, no, that's it. Uh, I, I think it's it's an awesome thing that you're doing with this podcast. I did listen to a couple more episodes, listen to uh, Chuck Luce's episode and uh, uh I'm blanking on his name, Roach, Mo Roach Motel guy. Uh, Jeff Hodat. Yeah, yeah. Um, those were really great. No, it's 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 cool. It's a great uh, it's a great place to be from, and uh, yeah, I'm always like really appreciative of the of the scene that we had down there. That I assume you know is is still kind of going in its own right, even uh, you know with 
change of the guards or whatever. But uh, um, yeah, it's always been a really cool um, place for music and and some of my favorite bands, you know, are still from there. Oh, one other quick plug, speaking of uh, South Florida bands, I'm, I do a zine called Lore, L-O-R-E, uh, fanzine. Thank you for bringing that up because we've been talking so much and slipped my mind. Yeah, no, I'll go forever. <laughs> um, but lore basically is a zine that is uh, each issue is dedicated to a, a demo. Um, the first one uh, was about a band called Trauma from North Miami Beach uh, and their 1991, 92 demo. And then um, I'm a I'm about to finally start putting assembling and make ready for sale the second issue which is about uh timescape zero um who are one of my uh very favorite florida hardcore bands um in my mind the true progenitors of metallic hardcore in south florida um and uh their uh their demo the, the welcome to the cali yuga demo which was huge for me when I was younger so the zine is kind of cool because it's just it's it's a way for me to sort of dig into like the events that led up to the demo and you know what how the band came together and and uh um, I like the demo era of a, of a band so it's got you know flyers and photos and interviews and all that kind of backstory and then it'll come in a custom printed um, box with uh with some other goodies um in inside of it uh and um a remastered reissue of the uh the welcome to the Kali Yuga cassette um so that's I'm pretty stoked about that because I think that was a really interesting band and a really really killer killer uh demo and um I think their story is really important to what South Florida uh hardcore came to be known for which was metallic uh hardcore um, but, uh, yeah, I think that, that, uh, Timescape Zero was, was the first to do it and, and, uh, um, not, not as widely known as some of the bands that followed. Um, but I think they deserve a lot more credit than maybe people realize, uh, for that different type of metallic hardcore, but metallic nonetheless. <clears throat> Yeah. And it's great that you're doing that. And are, are, are a lot of these tapes from your own personal archive as well? They were just they were just tapes that were important to me when I was younger. Um, so the trauma one, I had to actually track down from the band. I got the DAT, um, okay, and then had that digitized and remastered. And that was my first time hearing all of the songs in thirty years. Wow! Um, but the Timescape Zero uh, that demo, I've never really stopped listening to. Um, so it was nice to remaster it because it's louder and it's got a, a little bit more punched in the early 90s uh recording that they got but the intent was not necessarily to just do stuff from uh from florida um but these two these first two uh issues are yeah they're just about two demos that were kind of uh yeah just important to me in the early 90s so i don't know what will happen after this one but I'm pretty excited to get it. Yeah, out. man, that's awesome. That's great. And we'll definitely include the link in the description of our interview to the lore uh, zine. So people can check that out. And also other links to, to uh, Ask Friends Ross and some other projects that you have going on simultaneously. So uh, awesome stuff, man. Oh, great. Great to know that you're still in it, man. You're still, it doesn't sound like you're have any signs of slowing down. At least that not, not at this given moment, what, you're picking it up. You're picking yeah. it up. I'm picking it up. Yeah. There, there are a couple other projects going on. <laughs> in addition to Damien Dunn and Aspirin Thrust and the death metal thing, there are a couple other things too, but uh, yeah, I think I just reached a point where I was like, you know what? Um, this ride is like starting to slow down, you know, wind <laughs> wind down you know it's uh it's a short life and um there's just no reason to not do the shit that's fun to do you know unless it's uh, something horrible that you shouldn't be doing but um hardcore singing in hardcore bands uh has typically not been that for me so it's uh yeah it's just it's fun so you just uh you just do it there's no reason not to we're all gonna die you know <laughs> 